When I was in middle school and high school, my buddies and I were obsessed with studying the paranormal. I had every book on ghost lore that there was, and I had read them cover to cover. We would build websites with our favorite stories and local folk legends. We eventually began doing films and video expeditions at night to houses, cemeteries, caves, etc. in the surrounding area. This is just a short collection of a few of the more eerie and fun things that happened. It started off with my dad driving us out to these places at night. We would tramp off into a field or cemetery while he stayed in the car and smoked a cigarette. I remember one night we walked up a hill into a graveyard and immediately heard howling coming from the area to our right. Two of the four of us freaked out and immediately headed back to the car. My buddy and I recognized it as a pack of coyotes and decided that they were more afraid of us than we were of them. There was still something that caught his eye and from our left, behind us at this point as we were distracted by the coyotes. He tore out before I had a chance to see what it was, and I was too slow to realize that I was standing alone in the middle of a graveyard in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere. When I turned around to see what the commotion was, I saw something that wasn't terrifying so much as befuddling. I heard the quick scamper of something relatively heavy running through the forest on the edge of the graveyard roughly 20 feet away. I shined my flashlight on it thinking that it was a deer, and I could see instantly that it was not. It was nothing. Not nothing as in there was nothing there. Nothing as in I could clearly see it kicking up leaves and hear the noise and even feel the vibration as it ran. But it was as if someone invisible were running through the forest not five yards away from me. I turned around and walked back to the car at that point, and haven't been back since. Later, when I got my license, I would drive us out on our own. One of our first treks was to the big house on my 16th birthday. We had to walk through about a mile of cow pasture to get there, but it was worth it. This was a classic haunted house with twisted stairways and decrepit fireplaces and a spooky attic. We had entirely too many people with us at that point, so it eventually devolved into me telling my best scary stories to guys laughing nervously and girls shrieking. We left after maybe an hour of exploring with nothing but some pictures of orbs and stuff to take back. My buddy, the ghost hunter, and I hung back when everyone else had left, walking a few yards behind. I suddenly got the feeling that we had left someone and did a quick head count of those in front. Nobody was missing. I looked behind at the house on top of the hill and saw a candlelight flitting from window to window in the attic. We sped our steps up a bit and caught up to the group without looking back again. To get to the big house, you have to go through a cemetery where a moderately famous Confederate officer was buried by the name of Champ Ferguson. My buddy and I decided to go back to this cemetery due to the violent nature of his death. He was hanged for treason in Nashville and do some looking around. We took our flashlights and our camcorder. You have to park at the bottom of a small hill and climb some stairs to get into the small cemetery, and we made our way back into the very back where the officer's tomb was. I had my night vision on in my camcorder, and the screen flipped out, so I was using that to guide me through the otherwise completely dark graveyard. My friend had a flashlight that he was using, and I had mine in my pocket. We always checked the batteries to make sure that everything was working well before we left on these excursions. As I knelt down beside the headstone and was reading, the light from my friend's flashlight went out. I asked him to point it back in my direction to illuminate the faded text, and he said that he couldn't. It had died. I gave him mine, and he tried it, to no avail. Suddenly, the camcorder went out as well. We were in the middle of the dark, with no one around for miles. We did relatively well staying calm. We had to grope our way around the tombs to get back to the road, all the while with the intense feeling of being watched from multiple sides. 
I almost broke my ankle when I got back to the small retainer wall and forgot about the steps in my hurry to get back into the safety of the car. This isn't a scary story per se, it's more eerie and odd. Just a disclaimer in case you're expecting otherwise. I met David 18 years ago when I was just 14. He was an idol for me when I first met him. He did so many fascinating things. He was a special effects artist on several television shows that were filmed in Miami, Chicago, and New Orleans. He was a sword slash bladesmith, and he would render 3D images to help work on historically accurate swords for museums when the original couldn't be displayed due to research. He was amazing, and through all the years, he never lost his shine. When I was young, I wanted to be just like him. He told me very early on that he hated his name, and went by Monkey. This made me laugh so hard, as he imitated a monkey as he told me his name preference. To his best friends, Heather, Keenan, Pixie, and myself, he wasn't just a person. He was a shining star. Skipping forward many years to 2015, I bought a house in New Orleans. I hadn't quite lost track of him, but I was in my own world because of a death in the family. In late 2016, we reconnected at a club outside of Chicago, and I invited him out to visit me in New Orleans. In spring of 2017, he took me up on that, and he flew down, and it was like no time had passed. He was still the same exact shining star that I remembered. Still the goofy monkey that I remembered. In 2018, I went back to Chicago to help with family, and he stayed in New Orleans. In 2019, I was touring with a band, and we had a stop in New Orleans, and I had found out that our friend Carter had passed away. It hit us both very hard, as Carter was in his early 30s just like me, but we were able to console each other. That was the last time that I saw Monkey, at a funeral. I had brought him a necklace that Carter had made, but I never got the chance to give it to him. We kept in contact over the phone after that, as I needed to get back to Chicago and he chose to stay in New Orleans. 2020, COVID started and made it impossible to visit for a while. But that brings me to now. November 2nd for me, as I'm currently in the UK, but it was November 1st over there, with the time difference and all. I was woken up by a mutual friend ringing my phone off the hook at 5 a.m. UK time. I answered it, and they didn't give me much info, just that he was in an ambulance and that they needed to get in contact with his parents. Enter Heather again. I called her immediately, and she got everyone in contact. As I was starting to fall asleep again, she called me and let me know that he hadn't made it. I don't remember how I took it over the phone. I think I was just in shock and disbelief. Later that day, I went looking for his social media and it was all gone. None of us could find it. At some point that evening, I went scrolling through Instagram as one does. One of his deleted profiles popped up and I clicked on it. How it reactivated after his passing, I have no clue. Immediately, I was drawn to a photo of him, so I clicked on that. The caption was, Very alive and very well. I hope the same for you. And I know that he was trying to reassure me by leading me to that photo. The photo itself was from 2018, but I had never seen it before. I don't believe in coincidence, so I am damn certain that this was his way of saying goodbye and telling me that he was okay, wherever he is. It still makes me cry, and it will for a while, but I appreciate the message from him. The profile disappeared again the very next day. It might seem mundane to some, but I could almost feel him in the room trying to comfort me. Rest in peace, David Mad Monkey. Those of us still on Earth miss you. I have had many paranormal experiences throughout my life. I'm a spiritual person and have always been interested in the supernatural. 
This particular experience took place when I was 13. My mom, dad, sister, and I had to move because of my dad's work. This time, we were bound for Florida. At first, things at our new house were great. Then, a few weeks later, things started to occur. Our belongings were being moved from one place to another, for example. Next, I heard whispers and other inexplicable sounds. My family began hearing things soon after, as well as all of us starting to see shadows around the home. We were frightened. Most of the time, I would be staying home alone with my sister. During that time, I would see shadows moving, kitchen items would fall or be thrown. My sister and I would hear whispers. Then one day, there was a smell. Whatever it was, it was disgusting, like something putrefied. We searched high and low for the origin of the odor, unable to discover the source anywhere. This continued for weeks, until Dad decided to talk to the landlord. The landlord told us that the home's previous owner had been killed in the house. Since then, a lot of people who stayed there reported strange experiences, including the smell my dad was furious. Soon after, we moved into another house. I still think about that to this day, though. I can't help myself. I get sleep paralysis. And it's always the same thing. A pair of young twins would appear. One was in a little dress and pigtails, the other with suspenders and slacks. They never talked, let alone gave me their names, so I called them Tammy and Tucker. They had black skin. Not like African-American skin, but black as the night, barely more than a living shadow, with yellow eyes that flickered. The way that they moved was just freaky. They changed positions with my every blink, like a weeping angel, or SCP-173. For the first hour, or five blinks after I woke up, there was nothing but the darkness of my room. Then my vision would get slightly lighter, like I had an invisible nightlight that just lit up my whole room. On the next blink, my closet door would open, with a little clawed hand peeping out like it had been in the middle of clawing its way out of the dark depths of my closet. On the next, a hand would appear on the floor under my bed, and the one in my closet would be a full arm. My bed had about a foot of space under it, so I imagine a small child would have no trouble fitting underneath. On the next blink, the hand under my bed would be flipped, frozen in time in the middle of clawing at my bed sheets, and I would see Tammy's head poking out of my closet, staring at me. On the next blink, I would see Tucker's head poking out of the underside of my bed, and Tammy would have moved onto the ceiling, on all fours, her head broken around, just to stare at me. And then, on the next blink, Tucker's head would be upright, his chin resting on my bed, staring at me with his flickering eyes, and Tammy would be closer. On the next, Tucker would be at the foot of my bed, on his knees, staring at me, and I would be able to feel his weight. Tammy would be in the middle of my room. On the next, Tucker would be sitting on my thighs and Tammy would be at my bedside. And on the final blink, I would see their mouths open almost as wide as their heads, revealing rows upon rows of pearly white teeth curved like daggers, ready to sink into my flesh, so close to me that I could feel their breath, cold as ice on my face. Then, with the last blink, they would be gone. No traces of them left. 
except for the bruises that appeared on my legs the following morning. One of the many reasons I would have trouble falling asleep is that once the paralysis started, my eyes wouldn't allow me to surpass the amount of time that the twins wanted me for, and I couldn't just rapidly blink for them to go away. It was as though my eyes were being held open against my will. Once the paralysis wore off, about four blinks after the twins left, I wouldn't be able to make a sound until I drifted off to sleep. I have had two premonitions up to now. Both happened in 1992, a long time ago, but a year full of disasters in the Netherlands. In both dreams, I was standing in front of a window, observing the disaster unfolding. These dreams were also so vivid that I can still remember them in clear detail. The first one was that suddenly, I was in an office looking outside overlooking a chemical factory. I immediately knew that it was the Sindhu factory nearby. Suddenly one of the reactor vessels exploded, setting the whole of the factory into flames. A few days later, on July 8th, 1992, it did indeed happen. A trainee operator used the wrong recipe for the process. The reactor vessel overheated. The company brigade started cooling the vessel down, but to no avail. The vessel exploded. One of the valves was found two kilometers away. The three firemen died, and eleven other employees were injured, of which one had very severe burns. A few months later, at the end of September in 1992, suddenly I again had a vivid dream of standing in front of a window, this time at the Gilmer area in the southeast of Amsterdam. I saw military planes dropping bombs on a block of apartments. In the early evening of October 4, 1992, an El Al cargo Boeing took off from Amsterdam Airport, heading to Tel Aviv. Just after takeoff, the captain notified traffic control that they had lost power in two engines and requested to return. What he didn't know was that he not only lost power in these engines, he physically lost the two engines. I think that they were actually the bombs that I thought I saw falling. The captain had very big troubles in controlling the airplane. He made some circles go up to the point that he could not hold the plane anymore, and it plunged almost nose down into the corner where two blocks of apartments met. It left a burning hole of rubble, eight stories over a length of about ten apartments, gone. The death toll was 43, of which four were aboard the plane. I have since then not had these kinds of dreams anymore. Maybe because both disasters happened within a radius of less than 10 kilometers from where I lived back then. I posted this in a UFO subreddit as I was not sure what a crawler was until after doing a bit of research. There's a possibility that what I saw that night may have been a crawler as much as it could have been an alien. I never saw a UFO, but I saw an entity mostly associated with UFOs. I grew up in the USSR, in now northern Belarus, until I was 13 years old. Thirty-seven years ago, my mother and I saw an entity outside looking in at us through the window. It was hairless, pale white, huge, bulging black eyes. And it had teeth that were very small, very well spaced, skinny, and pointed, almost like an anglerfish. We hid for hours until we heard my father return home. We both looked out to see the being stand up from behind a wall. It was much taller than a human. It was hiding back there behind that wall. 
and I believe that it was waiting for us to come outside. My father drove up the driveway, and we saw the silhouette of its body from the back. It was hunched over staring at the car. My father saw it in the headlights, and what it looked like perfectly. He drove at it, and it ran away into the brush around the house. It never made a sound. It seemed smart but cautious, and the overwhelming feeling that I got that night was that it was vicious and violent. My parents spoke with the police, as we were so horrified about the encounter. After speaking to the police or the KGB, we were relocated and forced to never speak of the event to anyone. Within 30 hours, I was living in a new home nearly 100 kilometers away. I have searched for so many years for an explanation. I've spoken to government officials in Belarus. I have had interviews with people who lived near our home then about 10 years ago. I have no answers. My fiancé first encountered this thing in 2013. He and his friends were on a camping trip up in the woods in Maine. Middle of nowhere, literally. No houses, nothing for miles. They had a small fire going, but due to the rain it was hard to keep it going. They kept hearing something trying to creep up on them. It was kind of noisy and sounded big but was only on two feet. They started throwing rocks in the direction where they heard the footsteps coming from, and suddenly this thing let out a blood-curdling scream. Nothing any of them had ever heard before. He describes it as something that sounds like a fox, but slightly more human. It went crashing through the woods super clumsily, but kept trying to come back. They had to fend it off for most of the night. The second encounter was about a year and a half later. He was out on a solo camping trip in Vermont since that was something that he enjoyed. He heard the exact same blood-curling scream that he had heard the first time. He was just sitting alone in the dark, looking at the stars with no fire or anything, when suddenly... He heard the scream again. He quickly packed everything up and just went home. No hesitation. The third time was tonight. He was supposed to go out to my car to grab us a couple bottles of water when he heard the voices. Due to us recently having someone coming onto our property and stealing from our landlords, he went to investigate. He calls me and tells me to let the dog out. As he was sneaking around, the voices turned into a snarling sound. He quickly stopped, turning off his flashlight, and dropped to the ground. The dog was standing next to him. Suddenly he sees two glowing eyes, and it lunges at him. The dog gets excited and starts chasing it. The whole time they're chasing it, it's screaming and running faster than our dog. Even though he was running with a flashlight, he couldn't make out a shape of its body. He says by how far apart the eyes were, it seemed kind of big. He couldn't get a shape or color besides where its body should be was a slight discoloration of the darkness around it. It kept looking back at him while he chased, and its eyes were just glowing while it screamed. Our dog chased it off into the woods, but luckily she came back. I think it was trying to lure him in by making it sound like voices, but the dog scared it. He said he couldn't get a height because the eye level kept changing from squatting to standing up, and then it started running. Has anyone experienced anything like this? Or knows what this animal or supernatural thing could be?
could be. In 1999, I moved back to Washington State after traveling around the country for four years. My grandmother let me move in with her for a while so that I could get back on my feet. I hated the basement of her house. Always have. But it was free rent and she was cool with Chuck, my 90-pound black lab. Plus, my gramps and I got along pretty well. Late one night, about three months into me staying there, I woke up because Chuck kept moving around on the bed and was shaking the mattress. Then I heard him start grumping. You know, those grumpy groans that old dogs make when you scratch behind their ears and they love it. He started doing that. Once I realized what I was hearing, I sat up to yell at him to go back to sleep. That's when I discovered the reason that he was moving around so much. He was trying to get closer to the woman who was standing right next to my bed, scratching him behind the ear. I didn't scream, and I'm proud of that. But also, what the actual hell? Where did she come from? Who was she? Why was she standing in my room petting my dog at 3 a.m.? I was too afraid to ask. I did the only thing I knew how to in those situations. I hid under the blanket. Certainly she would be gone by the time I re-emerged from underneath it. That's how these things are supposed to work, right? I waited for a little while, but when I came out from under the blanket, she was still there. So I hid under there again three more times. Every time I came back out, she would still be there, smiling at me and scratching my dog's ears. The last time I was under the covers, I realized that I wasn't actually afraid of the woman. Chuck and I met under stressful situations for both of us, and because of that, he and I had a super strong bond. I trusted him implicitly. If she had meant me harm, he would have reacted to her negatively. But his reaction was clearly positive, so I figured that she probably wasn't there to kill me. So I came out from under the blanket one last time, intending to deal with the freaky woman still standing right next to me. Somehow I had decided that by turning on the light, it would make her disappear. I reached over and snapped on the bedside lamp. I don't know why I thought that that would work. Is that even a thing? Are ghosts supposed to disappear in the light? Well, I turned it on and she didn't, so I don't think it's a real thing. By then, she had been standing at my bedside petting Chuck for several minutes, and I was out of ghost-busting options, so I gave up on being terrified and just looked at her. Really looked at her. I can still see her right now in my mind, dressed up in a classy brown pantsuit with a cream-colored blouse. She had shoulder-length auburn hair styled beautifully with these big, loopy curls. She looked like she had been on her way to work a party, and she had only stopped for a second to say hello. She was very pretty. She looked happy. I didn't have the nerve to talk to her, or at least I don't remember speaking. But I stayed present, and we both looked at each other for quite a while. I remember having the distinct impression of her knowing that I was there, of both of us being aware of the other. Then she stopped petting Chuck and walked to the end of my bed, stood up straight and proud, and dissolved away. I mean that very literally. First her clothes, then her skin, her organs, and her bones. Like that Nazi at the end of Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. I remember what her blood looked like as it dissolved to reveal her skeleton. That should be a gross and terrifying memory. But I don't recall it like that. At the time, it felt like she was doing it on purpose. Like she had wanted to make the most dramatic exit that she could manage. I remember thinking, this should scare the pants off of me, but also, wow. Somehow, I did go back to sleep. In the morning, over coffee, I was going to tell my grandmother about what had happened, but she had just received an upsetting phone call. Apparently, her best friend from high school, Ursula, had passed away in the middle of the night. I'd heard stories about their teenage shenanigans, especially the one about the stolen birthday cake. But I never saw a picture of Ursula, so I asked what she looked like. 
I couldn't tell you what she looked like these days, but when she was young, she had the most beautiful curly auburn hair, is what my grandmother said. That's not the only weird thing that happened in my grandmother's basement, but it does remain the most vivid, without a doubt. During the past few years, my gifts of clairvoyancy have developed further, which has created some moments where I truly have questioned my sanity. Former teachers of mine have communicated to me from beyond their grave. Two of them have led me to where they are buried, and I have predicted three district deaths. The first teacher to come through was actually a nurse from the local school, followed by my sixth grade social studies teacher, I was aware that the nurse had passed away in 2012, so I wasn't surprised when she came through. However, I was unaware of the second one passing, and immediately went into denial mode. Eventually, through clues via dreams and meditation, I was able to locate her final resting place. I went from being in denial to being absolutely speechless. I followed the clues that she gave me, and there I was, at her grave. It was at that moment that I realized that what I was dealing with was reality and that I was not losing my mind. The creepy thing is the numbers of her plot are the same as the numbers in the school district where she taught. As I was visiting her on March 1st, 2017, I had a flash or image prediction about another former teacher passing away and they would be buried in the same cemetery. On March 6th, Another one of my sixth grade teachers passed away, and a few days later, they were buried in the same cemetery. The process repeated itself, and he led me to where he is buried. That isn't the only death or dreams, visions that I've had. I've had two others. One was in December of 2016, hours after the teacher passed away, and one was in June 2017, six months prior to her passing. There seems to be no time structure when it comes to dreams or visions and the time of passing itself. It ranges in hours after to six months before. A couple of months ago, I had another dream. And while nothing has happened as of yet, I am very concerned. When I was younger and inexperienced, I decided to go to a spot in my small town that is supposed to be haunted. The story goes back to the 60s, when a man and a woman with two children got into a major argument, and she decided to leave with her kids. She packed up and left with her son and daughter, and began to head over a small bridge just south of town, when she noticed that the husband was coming after her in his vehicle. Outraged, he ran her off the bridge and killed her and the two children. She now wanders the bed of what used to be a river, looking for her kids. So my buddy and I were investigating there, and we didn't hear anything, so we decided to go to the other side of the river. We were using EVP only at that time. The few hours we stayed there, we didn't pick up anything. We went home, transferred the sound to a computer, and plugged the computer into our television, and then we heard a few sounds. One was at a time in the investigation when my buddy had tripped over a stick poking out of the ground, and you could hear a little girl giggling. The second was when we decided to move to the other side of the river and announced to the ghosts present that we were moving, and we heard the most eerie, slow-speaking voice of the little girl that said, Please don't leave me. We were never touched or harmed in any way, but after a while, we realized that we failed to introduce ourselves and that we did not ask anything present to not follow or attach itself to us. The night afterward, my mother told me that she was going to take a bath and asked us if anyone else had to use the restroom. My friends and I said no, and we continued to play our video game. Next thing we know, we heard screams coming from the bathroom. 
My stepfather ran into the bathroom, and my mother came out wrapped in a towel, mad and upset that we went ghost hunting, and she believed that something was messing with her. She went to her room and got dressed, and came back out and said that her back was burning. I lifted up the back of her shirt to see my initials scratched into her skin. At this time, I was a bit worried and frightened, and I told her to lay on the couch so that I could keep an eye on her as she said that she was tired. She then woke up a few hours later, but didn't seem fully awake, almost as if she were in a trance, sweating profusely, and her hair was soaked. She began mumbling weird things that we couldn't understand, and started saying 666 and drawing a pentagram in the air with her finger. I decided to look up a prayer, hoping that this would help. I ended up finding the St. Michael prayer, and my friends and I began chanting it. As we were chanting, she began screaming and cursing in a disembodied voice, and then suddenly dropped back down to the couch and passed back out. She woke up like nothing had even happened, and was confused as we explained. After time passed and nothing else occurred, I decided to go to a friend's house who was female. As I was headed there, I got a text message notification that said, Where are you going? You're not. I clicked on the notification to finish reading the message, but the text had vanished. I called my mother and asked if anyone from the house had messaged me, and she said no. So ignoring it, I went on over to my friend's house. It was around 1 a.m., so we went to her room and laid in bed, and she got up saying that she had to go to the restroom. As I lay there, I began to hear growling noises coming from her bedroom closet. When she got back, because I wasn't going to go and look, I asked, Do you have a dog in your closet or something? And she replied, No, I don't own a dog. We're not allowed to have animals here. I was freaked out the rest of the night and didn't fall asleep until almost 4 a.m., listening to see if I could hear anything else. After awakening, of course, I was really tired. I called my mother to make sure everything was okay, and she said that nothing else happened while I was gone. And nothing else has happened since. Moral of the story is don't meddle in things that you don't understand or have not studied or prepared to deal with. I'm still interested in ghost hunting and may do so in the future as I'm now more educated on the subject and will take better precautions from here on out. A few years ago, I was still in high school, and out of my own curiosity, I tried to lucid dream. I started recording dreams for a month, as soon as I woke up. I had all of them written out on a big notepad, but I never really got it to work. Anyway, one night I had a dream where a friend came to me right before I woke up, and the only thing that happened was him telling me, something bad is gonna happen soon. A few days later, I completely forgot about this, but the same friend in real life keeps acting really just down in the dumps. I ask him what's wrong, and he said it's just a bummer because his uncle had a heart attack and he's worried about him. To add to it, I get a call later that day telling me that my uncle also had a heart attack on the same day and died. At that point, I had to break this weird story to him. Premonition? Are just pretty creepy coincidence. He believes the story, even though I would have been skeptical. I work on oil rigs. I have ever since I was 20, and I'm 33 now. In 2007, I was working for Nomac Drilling. They have since sold out to Patterson. And we were drilling in the Haynesville for natural gas. Anyone who works on rigs knows that the work can take you way off the beaten path from what normal civilization is used to. Some places, you're on ranch roads for an hour before you reach the location 
and others you're driving on roads canopy by trees in the backwoods of Louisiana. This happened to me in the latter. We were rigging down after finishing a well, and we were on our last night of the seven-day hitch. About halfway through our twelve-hour tower, we had pretty much finished and were making sure everything was tied down securely for the rig move. We killed the light plants, and the driller let us knock off early. This area was accessible outside Houghton, Louisiana and the lease was actually on the back of the Barksdale AF base, but we had to leave the way we came in. Driving home at two in the morning seemed pretty normal at first, and I made it to the blacktop with no issues. The blacktop was still canopy by trees, and other than the lights from my truck, everything was pitch black. Out of nowhere, still basically in the middle of nowhere, this thing appears almost close enough to get hit on my driver's side. Okay, weird. But even more strange, he was leaning at what I swear was an impossible angle for someone to not tip over. Its hands were stretched, reaching towards my truck, and what I could see of the face was morbid and twisted. The hairs on the back of my neck raised and I gassed it to speed back closer to society. It was about a two-hour drive home, and I felt off for the rest of the trip. More oddly, I was working over on a separate occasion with one of the crews that work when I'm home, and another hand was talking about a very similar, if not identical, experience. I don't know who or what I saw, and the face could have been a blur from relative distance, speed, and the time I actually saw them. But who is out that late, and why? If someone was broken down, I could see them trying to flag me. But this didn't seem to be the case here. Yesterday, I took the day off of work to do a bunch of chores around the house, so I was home alone. One of the things I had to do was turn in our old cable equipment and DSL router, get new equipment, and install it. My house was built in the early 1950s, that is, the upstairs part. We have a downstairs part that's a new addition built sometime in the early 2000s. I only mention this so that you can understand that the upstairs of the house is a raised foundation with wooden floors throughout. The new addition is downstairs on concrete foundation. Upstairs, you can hear the footsteps of someone walking around with shoes on their feet. Downstairs, it's a little harder to hear because there's carpeting and it's on concrete, so if someone was running across the house on the upstairs older part, it's loud and echoey. Yesterday, as I said, I was home alone. It was early in the afternoon. I was downstairs installing the new router on the very far corner of the downstairs part of the house. As I was laying on the floor trying to locate the cables and put them in the right places, I heard loud running coming from the upstairs in the older part of the house. It's not possible that someone had come in and then left because all the doors and windows have sensors that make a chime when a door or window is open. I did not hear a chime, and no one who lived in the house should have been home. My wife was at work, and my son was at school. I quickly got up and did my best to listen to see if there really was someone in the house. I went to check and looked through each bedroom, through the kitchen, through the bathrooms. The front door was locked, and there's no way that anyone could have entered the house or run through it and left, as I said. I don't know what I heard, but it was definitely heavy footsteps, even though it was empty. I want to preface this by saying that I generally consider myself to be a rather skeptical person, and have written off most of cryptozoology and paranormal stuff as straight up bunk until this event. 
I try to see if there's a realistic reasoning behind most encounters and stories, if that makes sense. Now, let's get to the meat and potatoes of this story. It was the late summer of 2005 in Northeast Ohio. I was heading into my junior year of high school. I was spending the night over at my best friend's house and we decided for the hell of it to just go crash outside for the night with just sleeping bags. It was a peaceful enough evening. The weather was a nice, balmy, kind of warm and the air rang with the pleasant symphony of crickets and far-off spring peepers. Skies couldn't have been more clear, as it was that special sort of feeling in the air where you were far enough away from the last time it rained that the air didn't feel heavy anymore, and actually felt inviting instead of humid and miserable. This was as close to a picturesque summer evening as you could get. Everything was blanketed in the dark blue elegance of the evening light. Falling asleep was easy enough. This was a year that mosquitoes were remarkably in pretty low numbers, making sleeping unprotected with just a sleeping bag simple for once. Eventually, as bad luck would have it, I had to answer the call of nature, so I was roused from sleep to do so. My buddy's yard was a fairly large-sized one, with an area of woods bordering most of it. After finishing, I staggered back over to my sleeping bag, and noticed that my friend was not in his. We were staged a few feet apart in case a bear came and got someone in the middle of the night or something. It would leave enough time for the other one to run to safety. You know, bro stuff. In any case, I catch him in my peripheral vision just kind of standing along the side of a shed that was in his yard. I wasn't kidding when I said that this night was picturesque. The sky was so unnaturally clear that the starlight and what little of the crescent moon we had left led to quite a bit of light despite being in the dead of the night itself. However, the area where we chose to pee, with the shed included, happened to be nestled along the part of the yard that was the thickest with trees, leading to a large portion of the yard still being under heavy shadow. Kind of funny to think about, isn't it? Having a well-defined area of shade in the dead of night when you expect everything to be dark. Oh, have I mentioned that at this point it was also suspiciously quiet? The idyllic chirping of the frogs and crickets that had earlier ushered me to sleep was now nowhere to be heard. I hadn't realized it when I first woke up to do my business, but it was quiet the whole time since I had woken up. Honestly, the fact that it was so quiet may have been why I woke up in the first place, on top of answering nature's call. Focusing my attention back on my friend, I'm noticing that he's still standing by the shed. He was around the corner away from me, so I had to approach him from behind, and thankfully it seemed he was going to be done using the bathroom. And thankfully it seemed he was done going to the bathroom as his pants were up. Hey, what are you doing just standing around there? I ask as I circle around and approach to his left. I didn't even need to wait for an answer before I immediately saw what had him frozen. Roughly about 30 feet away, hidden among the thickest area of forest in the yard, way back behind the shed, it stood. I'm not the greatest with words, so please bear with me as I try my best to describe what befell my eyes. This creature was perhaps a few inches taller than myself and I was six foot at the time. However, that's where the similarities end. It stood on two legs with a hunched posture, as it appeared to have had its shoulders raised up with its head leaning slightly forward. It had arms, but the forearms were a bit longer than the upper arms, culminating into sickly-looking hands ending in long points, almost like claws. 
Though bathed in starlight and shadow, I could discern the skin of the beast was about a dark blue, dark grayish color. The head itself was mostly obscured by the shadows, but retained a general humanoid appearance. I couldn't make out a mouth or a jaw. But the most unnerving thing about it was that its eyes glowed red. Well, perhaps glowed is a bit of a sensationalist term. It actually looked more like the red-eye effect from old photos. However, it definitely illuminated the area immediately around the eye sockets. So, perhaps illuminate is the better term. This creature was so sickeningly frail and thin in build that there was no way it could have been a neighbor fucking with us, as it didn't even seem physically possible for something so thin to even be able to support weight on such a frame. And then it started moving. At this point, my fight or flight response told me to go screw myself, and I stood frozen in fear, just like my friend. The beast, already a horrific bastardization of the human form, now grotesquely bobbed its body up and down, as if attempting to take off in flight. I didn't notice it before, but there appeared to be a sort of cape behind its back. Though I say cape, it appeared to be of a ragged, fleshy texture, as if the skin on its back was flayed off and was dragging behind its arms. This sickening flesh cape waved with each flap of its arms, giving the illusion of wings. But that wasn't even the worst part. It emitted a noise. This wasn't a growl, or a roar, or even a scream. The sound it made was akin to a raspy inhale, like someone deeply out of breath. However, it still wasn't quite like that. There was like a sort of reverb to its breathing. It echoed quietly, yet still managed to be one of those sounds that you feel in your bones, each graveling breath raking its claws into your very soul as you're already frozen in horror. This dance felt like it went on for hours, but in reality it was only a few brief moments that passed. Our bodies finally made enough adrenaline that we were able to bolt and sprint to his house. We talked about it a few days later, but after a point, just didn't feel like reliving it anymore. Until we researched what cryptids were and settled on the idea we came across, and decided that people would think we were just full of it, and decided to not bother talking about it at all. To this day, I still don't know what I encountered but this experience has subconsciously kept me terrified of being in wooded areas after dark for all these years. In fact, last weekend my wife and kids and I were camping at a state campground, and it was the first time I had been outside at night in the woods since that day, and I was scared all night long. Thankfully nothing happened, and we had a nice weekend but it's crazy that this experience has affected me for so long. My wife was the only other person I shared this experience with, and at first she laughed it off, thinking I was kidding, until she saw how solemn that I got when I talked about it, and could see that it clearly was not a joke to me. She then confided in me that she's experienced her own paranormal things, so that's fun too. Superficially, I would say it resembled what people have described as the Mothman, but I never actually saw it take flight, and the eyes didn't glow nearly as bright as reports made it out to be. Also, the wings only looked like wings when it was flapping its arms, and I doubt that it could have actually flown with those raggedy skin flaps. But I'm definitely not going to be trying to figure it out. The only other guess was some kind of crawler, maybe, but I never saw it make any other action aside from the bobbing and arm waving.
So my story initially starts with me, an 18-year-old female, being a guitar player of six years. I started early in high school and loved to play. My guitar teacher was super chill and awesome, but he was no longer able to teach me as he was moving away. I felt like I still wanted to move forward with my learning, so I decided to look up other available guitar teachers nearby. I didn't have a driver's license back then, and my guitar case was too heavy for me to be traveling long distances for a couple of lessons a week. I find this one guitar instructor who lived surprisingly close, four or five streets down. We contacted, and he agreed to teach me. To give you guys a bit of an idea about this guy, he was a tall, slim, white guy. Even though he looked a tad on the scrappy side, you could definitely tell that he was strong. He would also mention how he did lots of outdoor sports. He looked to be around his early 40s, but I'm pretty sure he was actually in his mid-30s. He had these big, pale blue eyes, sunken cheeks, and was balding, had a shaved head. So yes, in retrospect, he did look rather disturbing, but I didn't want to go and judge a guy by looks at first encounter. On the first lesson, I went to his place with my guitar, but after seeing me play, he told me he couldn't teach me because he only taught beginners, even though I told him that I had played for six years. So for the rest of the time, we just jammed and chilled, and then I left. The next day, I got a text from him saying that he had an old guitar book he wasn't using and wanted to give to me. Earlier that day, I had a huge fight with my sister, so I was eager to get out of the house for a breather anyway. I met him at a halfway point to receive the book from him. After doing so, I said my goodbyes, but as I was leaving, he started to follow me. I was sort of confused at this point, but he just casually held conversations, so I just chatted with him on my way home. We got to my place. I dropped off the book, we played guitar together for a bit, and hung out. Suddenly, he started talking to me about a waterfall near his place. I was confused because I'd never heard of this place. Why would there be a waterfall nearby? I live in an urban neighborhood. He was super shocked that I hadn't seen it and insisted that we go. It's only ten minutes away, I promise. My stupid, naive ass agreed because he promised it was super close. So we headed out to this so-called waterfall. This is where shit went downhill. As we were walking to the waterfall, the conversation started to change. He asked what nationality I am, so I told him that I'm Korean. Suddenly, he hugged me super hard, saying, I love Koreans. I was bewildered at this point, but I awkwardly let it pass. He started talking about himself and how he dropped out of high school early because he had violent tendencies. He said he threw tables at his teachers and threatened kids. I let him talk but inside started to feel extremely uncomfortable. I was constantly checking around the street, but found there wasn't a single person to be seen. He continued to ask me uncomfortable things, like if I was a virgin, and how he liked to think about classical pieces in his mind while he had sex. I wish I was lying about that, but I'm not. At one point, he picked up a flower and tried to put it in my hair. I declined and pulled away from him. He told me that he liked flowers because he can preserve their beauty even after death. Now at this point, I'm shitting myself. My heart was pounding. I was terrified, but I didn't know how to tell him that I didn't want to go to this waterfall. It's been 20 minutes at this point and no such place has been seen. I constantly asked him where the waterfall was, but he brushed it off, saying, We're almost there. Eventually, after about 30 minutes of walking, we got to a random bush track. 
I'm beyond uncomfortable at this point, and my mind is racing for any excuse not to go in. I suddenly spotted a guy coming out of the bush track, and let me tell you, I couldn't have been more relieved to finally see another human being. I sent the guy a huge, pleading look, and he seemed perplexed. He glanced over at my guitar teacher, but didn't say anything and left. My heart sank. Now let me tell you, the guy actually wasn't lying about the waterfall. It really did exist. But who gives a shit at this point, right? I'm alone in a place I'm not familiar with, with a guy who is saying some really scary things. I let him walk ahead whilst behind my back I began texting my older sisters to call me ASAP. My phone rang, so I answered the call. My sister is on the line like, What the fuck is going on? Are you still with that guy? Where are you? I just faked a wobbly smile and answered, Hey, what's up? What? You want me to come home right now? It's an emergency. Okay, okay. Meanwhile, the guitar dude is watching me carefully. I told him I need to leave, and suddenly his facial expression changed. Why? He said in a low, intimidating way. His demeanor did a 180, no longer smiling. Why do you have to do as your sister tells you? His big, pale eyes were unblinking. I kept insisting that it was an emergency, but he was not budging one bit. He started demanding that the waterfall is literally right there and we're so close. At this point, the bush track that we had walked was sloped downward. I was wearing a pair of boots at the time, but was constantly slipping as we ventured down. It had dawned on me that even if I were to run, it was most likely that I would either slip or he would catch up to me very easily. Inside, I'm freaking out like crazy because I honestly have no idea how to get back. So eventually I decide the best thing to do is just agree and get this over with. I weakly agree that we can go and see this godforsaken waterfall only for five minutes max, then I need to leave. He suddenly changed back to all cheery again, and he was leading me again down to the waterfall. By now I have thoughts that I might actually die here. If he were to harm me in any way, there would be no one to hear my cries. So when he wasn't looking, I started taking pictures of my surroundings. Random part of the bush track, some distinct rocks. Because my thoughts were, if I were to get murdered here, then maybe, just maybe, the police might find this phone and trace it to me. There are no words to truly express that feeling of, I am going to be murdered. If anything were to happen, would my family be able to find me? No one would ever suspect to look at a place like this. By this time, the sky was getting dark, and the guitar guy insisted on making a fire near the waterfall. I just agreed. He made a small fire, and we just sat in silence, staring at the flames for a bit. I heard a small sigh beside me, but continued to stare at the fire. After about the third sigh, I glanced over at him. He was staring straight at me with his huge, unblinking eyes, the flames making a disturbing shadow over his smiling face. He stayed like that for a solid 15 seconds. He began to scoot over closer and asked if he could give me a massage. I told him no. He then asked if I was cold and tried to cuddle me. So I stood up and said five minutes was up, and I needed to leave. He seemed satisfied that we did spend some time at the waterfall, so he agreed to take me home. The whole time back, he was constantly nudging me and asking me why I was so quiet. I was beyond too traumatized to answer. He forced his arm in mine, and we linked arms all the way home. It suddenly started to rain, and he just paused and forced me to face him. 
he asked me if he could kiss me. For once, I looked him straight in the eyes and said no. He seemed offended and asked why not. It's just a kiss. It doesn't mean anything. I told him no again, and he let it go. We're almost at my house, finally, before he stopped and said, well, this is yours. For a second I was confused, but realized he mistook my house for a couple blocks down. I just nodded and said goodbye to him. I walked in the driveway to the front door, waited until he was definitely gone, before I bolted out and all the way home. My sister answered the door, furious and demanding what the hell had happened and why I didn't answer her 50 missed calls. I didn't even have the energy to say anything. I just went upstairs to the bathroom, took a scathingly hot shower, and scrubbed my body clean three times. I know this story is extremely long, but trust me, this wasn't even all the creepy shit this guy said to me. He continued to send me messages and call me, but I ignored him. He began to grow angry and demanded for his book back. I eventually told one of my friends who was mortified at what happened. She said to just ignore all his calls. I did have little comfort in the fact that he thought I lived a couple houses down, but was terrified every time the doorbell rang as I pictured one of my family members answering it to find him at the door with a knife to kill us all. My friend had insisted on going to the cops, but what was the point? I was 18, and technically he didn't do anything illegal. After I blocked his number, that was the last I'd ever hear from him. It took me another five years to recover from the trauma, though never completely. I am and always was connected to spirits in some way. I'm Native American, which does contribute to my sensitivity to otherworldly experiences. This particular experience happened about seven years ago. Growing up, I was a weird kid. In middle school, I was in the paranormal slash ghost hunter phase, watching anything that had to do with ghosts and hauntings that I could. Down the road from my house was a big and decrepit house, which always gave me and my friends really weird vibes, like something was watching us as we would walk past. One day, me, my sister, and my friend were looking on the app store for an app to keep us busy, a new thing to do that wasn't like what we did on a normal day. We found this app that claimed to pick up EVPs. We take the app to the house to test it out, being kind of skeptical. We sat up on the driveway asking questions. As we asked questions, to our surprise, we got answers. The app told us that the spirit was an eight-year-old boy named Shane who had died in a fire. This made us flip out, running down the road to my mom. She dismissed it since it was a free app on the Apple Store after all, so we dismissed it as well. A few years later, I was in class with a friend from high school and for some reason we started talking about ghosts and paranormal encounters. This friend had moved into the house down the road after the years of it being renovated and ready for a new family. She went on about how she would hear noises in her house and how she kept seeing a little boy. I instantly jump up at her saying this and I asked her, is he blonde? Did he look like he was about eight or ten? She raised her eyebrow, confused, but said, Yeah, how do you know this? This is where I explained what we did as kids, and how we didn't believe it, until she told me what she did. Apps like that are still skeptical to me, but I don't think the set of experiences were mere coincidences. To me, this is something more, and still sends a bit of a shiver down my spine to this day.
This may have been a huge coincidence, but last January I applied for my grandfather's military service records. He died in 1981, way before I was born. I applied for his records and didn't think anything more of it. Several months went by, and I assumed that things were just moving slowly. Six months later, without hearing any news of his records arriving, one night I had a very vivid dream. I don't often remember my dreams anymore. In my dream, I was in a very white, very bare room with high walls and a high ceiling. On a small table in front of me was a box, and inside was my grandfather's military service history. The dream simply revolved around my taking a good look through them. Nothing too exciting. The next morning I wake up and remember the dream, maybe around an hour after I got up. Ten minutes later, a large envelope drops through my letterbox. It was my grandfather's service records. Odd? Just coincidence? A second, much stranger event occurred on the evening when my grandmother passed away. She had passed in the early morning and had been taken to the Chapel of Rest, which was not too far from the apartment where I was living. That evening, my parents invited me and my girlfriend for a dinner to celebrate her life. In the car, as we drove past the chapel, a leaf landed on the windscreen. The leaf was a perfect heart shape upside down, so that the light from the streets illuminated the perfectness of the heart shape onto the car's dashboard. The leaf stayed on the windscreen for a minute or so, and right as we turned away and out of our town, it blew off and back toward the chapel itself. I do have a video of the leaf and the heart on the windshield. For a while afterward, shuffling footsteps and noises kept occurring in my parents' house, and they sounded exactly how my grandmother used to walk. We all heard them moving across the upstairs landing. After around two weeks, it stopped and has never happened since. Odd, strangely comforting, and food for thought for a semi-skeptic who finds the subject of the paranormal fascinating. A few years back, I had gone out with some friends to the mountains for a camping trip. And by camping trip, I mean everybody gets drunk or high around a fire in the middle of the woods and then passes out in their trucks. I was always the youngest of the friend group, and this took place before I found my taste for mind-altering substances. I'm typically something of a skeptic, and if this had happened nowadays, I'd probably blame it on being drunk. But I was stone cold sober the whole time, which is why I feel so sure of what I saw. We're all out at the campsite, maybe 10 or 15 of us. I'm sitting on someone's tailgate smoking a cigarette when my friend, let's call him John, comes up to me clearly intoxicated. John was the one who I came out to the campsite with, and probably my closest friend out of anyone there. He asked me if I wanted to go on an adventure with him in the woods. I figured that if nothing else, I should probably go with him just to make sure that he didn't drunkenly fall over and hurt himself, not to mention that even though I didn't drink or do any drugs back then, didn't mean that I was opposed to fun adventures into the forest. So we walked past the tree line that surrounded the campfire and into the dense trees. The moon was out and it was a pretty clear night, so although it wasn't dark, it wasn't pitch black. We came to a clearing that seemed to be made of flattish boulders and rocks. We were looking up at the night sky and John was drunk talking and I was listening and nodding along with whatever nonsense he was saying. He took a seat on one of the flatter rocks, and eventually just laid down and passed out. I tried to jostle him awake, but he just kept mumbling for me to let him rest a while. Since this is usually how John behaves when he's drinking, I complied, and figured I'd head back to the campsite and check on him again in a little bit. I go back, talk to a few people, smoke a few cigarettes, and then decide to go and check on him. Maybe ten minutes have passed. 
I'm walking back to the clearing where I left him and already from afar noticed that he wasn't in the same spot. I kept going, figuring that he must have gotten up and wandered off somewhere. As I'm walking, I notice a shadow in the shape of a human standing behind a shrub of sorts a few feet to my right. I stop, figuring that it was John messing with me. I said, dude, come on, let's go back to the camp. No response. Then I gave him the stereotypical, please, you're not scaring me. Still nothing. I moved closer to the shadow and noticed that I couldn't make out any distinguishable features. No shirt logo, no eyes, or any face for that matter. Just a vacuum of black that stood in the shape of a man, hanging out with me in the forest. I backed away, putting it all together that it wasn't John, and I ran back to camp. I checked the truck that John and I drove out there in, and he was sleeping on the bench seat. I did a quick head count, and everyone that I had recalled being at the camp was still there. The only thing that convinces me that this was paranormal was just the sheer absence of light that this thing took the shape of. Just pure darkness. Whenever I tell this story, John always gets chills imagining that this thing was probably out there with him when he was passed out alone. The general conclusion was that John had stumbled back while I had left him, and I just didn't notice that he had returned. Like I said, I'm a skeptic, so I always try to rationalize these things. But this is the one experience that I've had that I just can't believe was simply my eyes playing tricks on me. I've heard of shadow people, but I always thought those were just what people saw during sleep paralysis. Not out in the wilderness, and not while fully awake. This happened about nine years ago. My mom had made this friend who claimed to be psychic. I've never really believed that she was, but that's a completely different story to tell. Anyway, she said that she enjoyed going ghost hunting. Mind you, this is when Ghost Hunters was a pretty popular show. And my mom, sisters, and I decided that it would be fun. We didn't have the special equipment that they had, but we did have a video camera and a voice recorder. We were good to go. We visited several cemeteries that summer and got some pretty awesome footage, which I can share later. This one has always stuck with me. So, in doing research on where we should go next, I found a post about the cemetery in Lafayette, Colorado. It said supposedly that a vampire was buried there. The post said that some people believed this because he was from Transylvania, and a tree grew right up through the middle of the grave where they said his heart would have been. We decided to go. About three hours later, we showed up at the cemetery that looks more like a park. We get out of the car and begin walking into the cemetery, looking through all the headstones. Not very far into our walk, we come to the vampire's resting place. The headstone is a plain slab of concrete with a line down the middle in the name of the man, when he died, and where he was from. My sister, toting the video camera, comes walking up next to me and says, So this is your stake, huh? We didn't hear anything weird, and continued to walk around after that. The cemetery was pretty mild in comparison to the others that we had been to. The feelings weren't overbearing or scary. Suddenly, Sandy comes running toward us, whispering frantically, We have to leave. We have to leave right now. They're coming. She's the psychic one. Anyway, we start rushing back to the car, and suddenly these police officers on bikes come riding up. They gave us a warning, saying that the park was officially closed for the evening, but that we could visit during the day. 
We drove home and plugged in the camera to check the footage. We got to the part where Elizabeth had asked, So this is your steak, huh? A reply immediately came saying, Yes, my steak. We went back several times to make sure that we weren't imagining it, but every single one of us heard those words. Skip forward a few years. I was taking my mom to the dentist, and when we got there in the waiting room, there was a book of the most haunted places in Colorado. Well, of course it piqued my interest. During her visit, I scanned the book, and about halfway through, I came to the page about the Lafayette vampire. The crew who investigated his grave had asked a similar question to Elizabeth's, and the response that they got, wait for it, yes, my stake. I started laughing. We were so sure that we had imagined it because we had wanted to hear it. But there's no imagining two separate groups of people who got the same exact response. If you ever get to Lafayette, Colorado, check it out. The cemetery isn't a scary or overly creepy one, but the response that you get from the vampire is real. The man or men in the grave weren't actually vampires. They were mine workers, and if I remember correctly, they died of the 1918 Spanish flu. They were poor and didn't have the money to send their bodies back to their homes for burial, so they are buried here. I hope you enjoy this one as much as I have for the last several years. It's definitely one moment or two that I will never forget. About two years ago, I visited the Auschwitz concentration camp with my parents. At one point, I separated from them because they are always slow while sightseeing. I entered the room that I later found out was used for torturing prisoners. Generally, throughout Auschwitz, I was feeling an overwhelming sadness, but I felt really strange in there. Sadness, helplessness, and apathy all mixed together. Then I heard a woman's voice singing. I was alone, and there were no speakers. I left this room and immediately stopped hearing that voice. When I returned to the room, the singing started up again, and I was still alone. I stayed there feeling an overwhelming sadness still until my mother joined me. Then, the singing stopped altogether. Unfortunately, I don't recall what she was singing about, just that the song and the whole vibe of the place carried this incredible, intense melancholy. I live in a forest outside of a large Croatian city. I consider myself lucky to live in a place so remote and peaceful, yet so close to civilization. It especially came as a blessing during the quarantine. That being said, living in this forest has its quirks that make you question how much of a heaven the place you call home actually is. I moved here around five years ago, but it was today that I finally discovered the dark truth about its past. I'd like to share what I found, but let's take it back first to the day when I realized that there might be something more to this place than the human eye can perceive. It was a hot summer day a few years ago and I was walking my dogs through the forest. I had recently discovered a new path that I had never walked before as I didn't know how long it was and how much time that it would take to walk through. This time, though, I had the whole day for myself, so I finally gave in to my curiosity and ventured into the unexplored area. It seemed fairly normal, although it was way more quiet and seemed more isolated than the rest of the forest paths. The path was surrounded by steep valleys on both sides, which ended in deep wooded areas at the bottom, probably inhabited only by animals, or at least nothing human. 
I stopped for a moment to give my dogs water and take a short break. I was sitting on the ground while they drank, and I was enjoying the calming sounds of the forest, until the peaceful atmosphere was sharply interrupted by something downright disturbing. I heard a human voice shouting from the bottom of a valley. But not just any voice. It was my voice. And it was calling my name. I stayed there for a couple more moments, just to make sure that I was hearing it right, as it didn't make any sense. Sure enough, it was calling my name, again and again. I got up and ran home as fast as I could. Every step of the way I felt watched, and more and more paranoid, as if I were being chased. I did my research at home. I wanted to find an explanation as to what had happened to me. It fit the profile of a skinwalker. I don't feel entirely confident to conclude that that's what it actually was, though. As I already said in the beginning, I'm from Croatia, and I don't know enough about skinwalkers to know if they can be found here, if they even exist. Anyhow, that possibility didn't make me any more comfortable. Unfortunately, it wasn't a single event. This was only the beginning of strange happenings for me in that forest. I have a hard time falling asleep, so I usually go out for a nightly stroll up and down the street before I go to bed. My street is surrounded by forests, but it didn't used to scare me. I was used to the way the darkness looks material in the trees, and I made peace with being exposed by the streetlights to anything that lurks within. After what I encountered, though, I can't shake the feeling of being watched and the sound of leaves rustling as if someone were walking in there in the dark every night that I take that walk. I will also sometimes hear my name being called from a distance, just like that summer day. I play it safe, so I casually stroll back into the house when it gets too intense, when I feel surrounded by invisible eyes preying on me, just waiting for the right moment. You have to play it cool. Don't let them know you know that they're there. Seem completely unbothered. Now, that skinwalker theory had stuck with me for a long time, even though I can't prove it. I feel like I was being stalked by one. That was until today, when I found out about something I think I should have known a long time ago. I always knew my forest is an unusual place. Part of it is a memorial park, full of strange monuments. I thought those were just there for soldiers that died during the war and didn't think much else of it. I'm currently in my fourth year of high school and we're learning about the world wars, so that sparked some curiosity to find out more about the forest. What I found left me in shock. Basically, horrible war crimes had taken place exactly there, and the ground is filled with mass graves of the executed and tortured soldiers. According to the official site of the Memorial Park's Virtual Museum, it is the quote-unquote site where the worst mass war crimes in the modern history of the city of Zagreb were committed. I was shocked, to say the least. Finding that information left me completely speechless. You'd think I had finally gotten my conclusion, an answer to what it is that haunts my forest. Instead, it just left me with even more questions. I don't know what entity spies on me or what its intentions are. I don't even know if it's an individual or if there's more of them working in unison against something that doesn't belong. The only thing I know for sure is the way it feels. In some way, my concerns seem justified. I most likely am not the only thing roaming these woods at night. The forest feels heavier now. The weight of the truth combined with the burden of worry leaves the night air tingling with tension. Oh, how the tables have turned. The presence I worry about the most right now is me. I might actually be the one disturbing the peace of things that were quietly buried in the soil. 
As much as I don't know their intentions, they also don't know about mine. I wish there was a way to make it clear that I approve of their ownership of these grounds, that I am okay with being merely a guest, privileged by their peace. So until further notice, I am the one haunting this place. I was in Florida for a high school marching band trip. This was three, maybe four years ago. We were marching in the Disney parade, so we got to go to all the theme parks, including Universal. One day we were in Clearwater. Myself and three guys who were part of my group were hanging out on the beach, far away from everyone else. Suddenly, I heard a deep voice say the word, no. It wasn't a yell, it was nothing close to a volume level that would have made me look around. It felt like a thought that I'd have in my mind, yet it was very clear and very distinct. It shook me up for a second, but I didn't want to mention it to any of the other guys. After about a minute though, one of them asked, Did you guys hear that? Instantly I replied, The no? It turned out that everyone had heard the exact same no in the exact same distinct male voice. Again, the nearest people were 60 feet away, and it was a mom and her kid, not a man, to begin with. We were on a beach, and it wasn't a yell, so the sound wouldn't have been able to travel that far. As a sound engineer, I can confidently say that a man, even with a deep voice, would have been unable to make a soft no loud enough to be heard from that distance. Nothing else happened. So while it may not be the most interesting or terrifying of stories, it made me go from being a skeptic to a believer. A few days ago, I started writing a script for a horror film. I was thinking about my experiences as a kid and what frightened me. The scariest thing that I remember is the first thing that came to mind, and also the most recent one that I can recall. When I was seven or eight, in the middle of summer, I woke up in the middle of the night. I thought it was because I was cold, which was uncomfortably odd because it was summer, and my bedroom is upstairs and insulated. I moved my curtain aside to see if the window was open, but it was closed tight. While I was looking at the window, I noticed a man standing in the street. The street lamp was on his back, so I couldn't see his face, but he was looking toward our house. What I noticed was that he was very tall. I think now that he was probably around six foot seven. It scared the crap out of me, so I pulled the curtain over the window and used the tacks from one of my posters to tack the curtain down, since the window didn't lock. I covered my head with my covers, because I knew that my dad would say it was a nightmare and give me a hug before sending me back to bed. I eventually did fall back asleep, but a few hours later, I woke up again. It was still very dark out, probably around 1 a.m., the first thing I noticed was my bedroom door was open. And I always shut my bedroom door because I'm a very private person. I got out of bed and went to go to the bathroom. I made sure as I was leaving the bathroom to close my door. Once I was done, as I was going up the stairs, I noticed that my door was open. At this point, I was pretty freaked out. I went into my room, and my heart dropped into my stomach. My bedspread was torn from my bed. The sheets were strewn across the floor. All my pictures and posters were taken off the walls, and the dresser was emptied onto my bed. 
I went into my sister's room because it was right across the hall. I felt even worse when I did this because she was fast asleep and all the papers had been pulled out of her desk. I woke her up, shaking her as hard as I could. I told her what had happened and we both ran downstairs to my dad's room. He helped us search the house, but we didn't find anything. Nothing had been taken and my sister and I's rooms were the only ones that had been trashed. We both slept in the living room for a few days because it was by my dad's room, but nothing happened. So we went back to life as normal and eventually forgot about it until now. In 2017, I was in Northern Ireland for a college field trip. My religious studies class was visiting stone circles to focus on religious geography. On this particular day, it was normal, cloudy, and we were enjoying learning the history of the Bronze Age of Wonder, excitedly waiting to go back to the hotel to begin a new day of pub hopping. I remember the stone circles being separated from the nearby woods with a small wire fence. For some reason, we were hanging around the fence, peering at the woods that lay not 20 yards away. We had yet to go into any woods during our trip, staying mainly at the sites surrounded by farmland. I remember wanting very much to go into this old forest for whatever reason. We all seemed to feel curious about it. I decided to climb over the small farm wire fence and see if there was anything interesting in the woods. These woods were different from the woods that I was used to in North America. The branches were thick, too thick to stand in. I had to bend at the waist to traverse them. The ground was covered in a soft light brown moss broken up by tree roots. I remember quickly moving under the branches, staring at the ground as to not trip. I felt giddy like I was a child going somewhere my parents told me not to. I felt light, and I began to pick up speed. I suddenly looked up to make sure that I wasn't about to run into a tree trunk when something made me stop in my tracks. I saw legs. Human legs. I could only see their legs, like someone was standing straight up in the trees. The branches, again, were too thick to stand in, but this person's legs were the only thing visible. I felt an almost animal response of fear, fear that didn't really make any sense. I told myself that they couldn't see me, because I couldn't see their face, but for some reason I felt that they knew I was there. Why would someone be out here? We were the only group at the circles, and there were no houses nearby. I looked behind me and realized that I was much farther into the woods than I had thought. I could barely see the light from the place where I had originally entered. It was so quiet. They had to have heard me approach. My only thought was, I'm closer to them than I am to the entrance. They could get me before I make it out. I was only standing there, bent over for no more than a minute, but it felt like forever. I didn't see them move, but I could tell that they were facing toward me, not away. I now really felt like I was somewhere that I wasn't supposed to be, only this time instead of giddiness, I felt nauseous. As if I were a deer and they a hunter, I turned and bolted. I flew through those trees, still bent to avoid collision. I didn't look down this time, stumbling as fast as I could, only focused on the light at the end of the trees. I felt the branches pull at my hair and clothing as I ran. I couldn't hear anything over my own breathing. As soon as I broke the tree line, I felt a weight lift. The group standing at the fence looked startled by me bursting out of the forest. I told them that I thought I had seen someone, but it almost felt wrong to talk about it. We left soon after. I have no idea what it was. 
Was it a person hanging out deep in the forest? Was it a fae, a spirit, the green man? All I know is that it felt otherworldly. Unfortunately, my dad died earlier this year, and the way he died was terrible, in which my whole family has to go to therapy. Yet, I still miss him and love him always. To get into the experience, I've moved around a lot this year due to personal problems since my dad's passing. I also got two puppies this year from the same litter, lost my dad and dog on the same day kind of like a replacement for the two loved ones that I did lose. One of the dogs was quiet and usually pretty chill, except that he had these moments where he would start staring at a wall or something in the room randomly, when he wouldn't normally do this. I know that dogs have a sixth sense about paranormal stuff, as well as cats and other animals. This behavior would happen about each month, around two to three times since I got him in May. Then I moved again to my godfather's house, which he's my dad's older brother. There are still some tense feelings here and there because it's a very sensitive topic for my godparents and dad's side of the family to talk about my dad or even to see videos or pictures of him. Around the same time I started my new job where it would require me waking up at two, three, sometimes four in the morning to leave for work. In front of my room, there'd be like a tiny light that's usually on sometimes when people forget to turn it off. There's nothing in the way of that light that could ever cause a shadow. One day I was leaving for work. It was about a week ago. I go to get my shoes and I'm about to leave through the front door when I look up and in front of the light, there is a shadow of a person. I immediately recognized who it was. It was my dad. The only reason I know him is because of his shoulders and height. I looked and saw his big shoulders and his head. I blinked and then it went away. I closed the door to the house and went to my car. Until about ten minutes later it hit me again that I had just seen my father. I think I cried about it after work, but I couldn't tell anyone for fear of them thinking that I've lost my mind. I'm going to start this out by giving some background on my mother. She's currently 58, a nurse, and a devoted Christian. Other than the occasional drink, she doesn't do anything to alter her mind. This story begins one day when my mom laid down for a nap. The way she described it, she wasn't asleep, but she began to see a video of sorts repeating in her head as soon as she closed her eyes. She saw a young teenage girl dressed in a schoolgirl outfit, floating away in a boat and waving. My mom could feel her emotions, her sadness and worry for her grandmother as she said goodbye. She could feel that this girl was going to a peaceful place. As well as this, she saw a calendar turn three times. This vision repeated itself once or twice, until my mother came too. She thought it was a vision of our family friend Shannon, but it didn't look quite like her. Later on, during the month of March, there was a shooting at a local rave. Shannon's younger sister was shot and killed. She was wearing the exact schoolgirl outfit that my mother saw her in during the vision. The fact that it happened in March means that the calendar was a warning of what was to come. We are unsure of why exactly my mom was meant to see this but we were able to provide some comfort to the family by letting them know that she was somewhere safe and peaceful. My friends and I used to camp a lot in the El Dorado National Forest. We had a spot along Sopiago Springs we used to camp at a lot. One weekend, we decided to go for a three-day foraging trip. 
We brought in MREs in case we couldn't find anything, some guns, and some supplies to set up shelter. But that's about it. The first night was chill. We cooked a bunch of crawdads and a squirrel my buddy shot, drank a few beers we'd brought, and slept fine. Next day, something felt weird to me. One of my friends who was with me and I had had some really creepy experiences in this part of the forest in the past, and it felt a bit like those. Forest was dead silent, and you felt like something was watching you. I grew up in the woods, so I know the signs of a predator, but this felt different than a bear or a mountain lion. When night fell, my friends went 200 yards or so up the stream to do some stuff, and I was alone at the campsite. The feeling got even stronger, so I built up the fire nice and big and grabbed a gun. I kept hearing faint voices from the woods in the opposite direction from where my friends had went. They were low and distinct sounds, but they were creeping me out majorly, and my buddies had taken the only two flashlights poor planning in hindsight. As I peered out into the darkness, I caught a glimpse of something moving fifty yards or so out into the trees. I snapped the rifle to my shoulder and got the scope on it. It was pretty dark, and the only light was from the fire, but I could see the outline of what I was aiming at. It looked human, but was on all fours and its arms seemed a lot longer than they should have been. It stood a bit like an ape, but very low to the ground. I only saw it for a second before it loped off deeper into the woods. After I lost track of it, I'd hear light rustling in different directions around the camp, leaves scuffling, the occasional twig breaking. Always away from where my friends went, 180 degrees on the other side of the camp from their departure. I got the sense that whatever it was, it was stalking me. I kept the fire high and was staying sharp, looking out into the woods. But I didn't see it again. My buddies came back about ten minutes later to find me a paranoid wreck glancing at the tree line with the scope. I told them what happened and they got quiet then told me the reason they came back when they did was they started hearing the same shit that I was hearing by where they were, and it had spooked them. We spent the second night of our trip with a big ass fire and three lookouts. Nobody slept that night. In the morning, we broke camp as quick as we could and hightailed it out of there. We never camped in that spot again. This happened to me when I was in high school. I was around 15, 16 years old, so it was around 2005 or 2006. Now, for context, this happened in France in a medium-sized city. I had to take one bus and one tram, tramway, to get to my high school. It was about 45 minutes to a one-hour trip. Usually classes start at 8.15 a.m. and the tram would be packed up with people as my high school was located next to the university and another high school. But that day my class started at 10 a.m. As a result, the tram was practically empty, which meant that I could get a seat for once. There was no seat by my side, only one seat in front of me. So I was sitting there listening to my music when a man sat down in front of me. He quickly started talking to me. I honestly don't remember what he was saying, but I was trying not to be rude as he seemed to have some sort of mild mental disability. But very quickly, he started asking me out. Remember, I was underage, and I definitely looked my age. He wondered if I wanted to go and get a drink. I said that I couldn't, that I had to go to class. He was very persistent. At some point, he took out his wallet and offered me money. 
I remember him saying something like, If it's about money, don't worry about it. He pulled out about 200 in cash. I was already creeped out by now and couldn't wait to get out of that tram, but I was also too shy to get out and sit somewhere else. That's when he pulled out a piece of paper. He was holding it in the air and I remember him doing a notion with his head like, look at this type of motion. It was an article from a newspaper that he had cut and kept inside of his wallet. I only had a few seconds to read what the article was about. All I had time to see was that something had happened to a woman. She had been assaulted. But that's it. That's all I had time to read before he put it back away. Now, as if this wasn't creepy enough, he had a giant smile on his face, like he was proud of himself, that type of smile. Whether he knew that woman, or if this was a random article he for some reason decided to keep with him at all times, it's just extremely unsettling. Not only that, but showing it to a random girl? Why? The piece of paper itself looked like it's been in his wallet for some time. It was a little torn, but definitely wasn't old. I eventually arrived at my stop. He kept insisting on meeting again. I denied and quickly walked to my school. After that, I saw him again, once, a few days later. This time, the tram was packed again, but I still felt the need to hide behind the people surrounding me, just in case he would see me and come talk to me again. The second time I saw him was maybe two or three years after. He looked exactly the same. I recognized him instantly. He was walking in the streets of the city and didn't see me. I realized I didn't give a physical description of the man, so here it is. He was average height, dark brown hair on the chubby side. He had glasses on, and the three times I saw him, he was always carrying a big backpack. The exact same military green backpack and the same jacket. I used to live on a large property with a lake, 29 acres of land and heavily forested. I was playing. I was about 11 or 12 at the time, outside by myself, right after the sun had set. I believe this was in the fall, so there were barely any lights to see outside, maybe except for a light on the house about 50 feet away from the swing set that I was on. Behind the swing set were really tall trees. Not many new or sapling trees were anywhere near. I know specifically that there were no trees short enough to have some owl or animal sit in them, because all the trees, pine trees, were mature and taller than my two-story house. My mom came out to tell me that dinner was almost ready. When she did this, she turned on the outside light on the back porch, illuminating the area so I could see. I was still on the swing set at the time. I start to get up, and I turn around, I think to find my flip-flops, when I see two bright eyes reflecting the light of the outside light looking at me from about twenty feet away. The eyes were well above any average human size, about seven, seven and a half feet off of the ground, and they were large. I stopped, stunned and really scared. I was familiar with the woods right behind the swing set, and I knew something unnatural was looking at me. I couldn't see the body, but the eyes looked at me and I tried to get an understanding, and I thought of something massive and humanoid. Bigfoot. Remind you that no animal could have levitated on that spot longer than five seconds. Even then, there were no perches or anything there to suspect critters. So to end my experience, I ran inside, locked all the doors, and couldn't think straight for the next couple of days. 
Let's just say I never played outside on that swing set after sunset ever again. I still think about this, and it chills me. Starting with a bit of backstory, I'm a born and raised Long Islander. So were my parents. They met out east, which in Islander talk means the east end of the island. To any New York City rich kids, that means the Hamptons. But for the rest of us who are coincidentally not millionaires, it means the North Fork. Not to get geographically confusing, but Long Island is, and accurately named, Long Island that forks off about three quarters of the way down the 90 miles that it stretches. It looks kind of like a fish with its mouth open, with the North Fork being where the eyes are and the Hamptons being the jaw. Shelter Island is somewhere in the middle, like a smaller fish about to be eaten. Honestly, just save yourself a lot of contemplating and just Google it. So, my mom's family had a summer house on the North Fork. My dad's family had a house on Shelter Island. My parents met working at a summer job, and the rest is clearly history. But super long explanation short, I grew up getting to pretend to be bougie, because I had not one, but two summer houses. Shelter Island was my favorite place. In a lot of ways, just the island itself feels magical. The only access is by ferry, and while traveling there, you feel like you're being transported into a different world. But the picture of Shelter Island in the summer is very different than the winter. In the summer, the population rises to around 20,000 people, but in the winter, no more than 2,000. There are something like 14 students in a graduating class, the people there literally dress up like each other for Halloween. This doesn't necessarily pertain to my encounter, but it's for real creepy and makes me wonder just how involved my encounter could be with the locals. So I was around 12 or 13. I had invited my best friend Lauren to come out with my family that weekend. I was so excited as it was the first time that Lauren was able to. I remember our bathroom was being renovated, and so the only other bathroom we could use was in the dank, dark basement. That's only connection to the house was by going outside and down the stairs, and then down another set of stairs, and into the basement itself. So it had to have been around 10 o'clock, and we went together to the bathroom to brush our teeth. The moon was almost full, so bright that it provided some light to an island where street lamps were few and far between. If it wasn't for the light of the moon, we probably would have passed the creature altogether without realizing, because out there you can hardly see two feet in front of you when it's dark. As we were coming back up the stairs, laughing about something menial, that was when we saw it. It was about ten feet away, with its back to us, lurking near my shed. We both froze, and did that thing where you take a quick breath and hold it involuntarily. That made the creature notice us. Its head whipped around, and his eyes were glowing a kind of blood red. It didn't look angry, per se, but rather like a feral dog. It didn't look angry, per se, but rather like a feral dog, not knowing how to react to these two little girls suddenly observing it. Almost as if not to scare us, he slowly rose up to full size, which I would guess was around seven feet. The whole time, it never broke eye contact. I felt I could fall into the pits of blood that its eyes were. It was covered in long, shaggy black hair and had legs like that of a beast. After standing there, frozen in horror, for at least a full minute, all the while in the middle of this staring contest, we both regained control of our feet and ran up the stairs, screaming for my parents. We told my dad repeatedly that we had seen a werewolf, and he went out first, and we followed. He quickly dismissed it and went back inside, a bit disgruntled. I could have sworn that I saw a bush nearby to where it had been move. 
Over the years, I've had many theories, one of which is that the natives who lived on the island before the white man are responsible, as shape-shifting legends are prevalent in indigenous people's cultures. However, skinwalkers in native legend usually choose to be so, very unlike the werewolf curse we so know and love. Maybe it's the descendants of the people who stole this land, cursed to turn under the full moon, choosing isolation to protect their secret for nine months out of the twelve, anyway. A few months back, really closer to a year ago, a friend of mine suggested that we do something interesting with our night for once. He told me about how he had been to one of the city's cemeteries after dark a few times and that it terrified him, but in that sort of way that makes it worthwhile. I was a little against it at first, because the cops liked to check on the area often, and there was no way we were going to be walking into the graveyard sober. Of course, however, my mind changed when we got to talking. You know about the witch? He started cracking a grin. I think so. I had heard very little. Remind me, just in case. So there's supposed to be this witch or ghost or some crap, and I know right where the grave is. Jesus, alright. I don't know exactly what I believe, but I know that the place is messed up. He paused, thinking hard. I said, I honestly don't believe in anything, but a dark graveyard is scary anyway. Definitely need to check it out sometime if we don't get to it tonight. He popped up with, oh man, I just remembered there are these dead kids. What? There's a bunch of graves together for this one family, and a bunch of them are these kids. That spot is extra creepy. They're all old as hell from like the 1800s or something. Well, I guess we gotta go see all of it. We pulled into the lot when the sun was setting and decided to smoke a little bit in the car since we had time anyway. As we smoked, the whole place emptied out and we were the only ones in sight. By this point, we were at a comfortable level of dissociative perfection, so we brought just a little bit of it with us. And of course my pack of cigarettes, which is no longer a habit of mine, but at the time was a means for managing stress. So, off we went, with a bit of sun still shining and one single truck riding through the cemetery. We figured it would be good to wait for the truck to leave, assuming it was a worker watching for any unwanted guests. Although they had left the gates wide open, we were a little unsure of the legality of being around after dark, and a little bit uneasy about some psycho employee ratting on us and getting us caught with what we had. After about 10 minutes and 3 or 4 rounds of the truck passing by, we figured it would be smart to just go ahead and hide wherever we were if he passed by us again. We made our way down the main hill that leads into the center of the cemetery, and we noticed a chill that seemed to pass as we entered the real part. I passed it off as a weird current made by the creeks and the cooler air in that area, but a part of the primal fear that remained in the back of my mind made me question my devotion to reality. There were a few times where we had to hide behind a tree as the truck made its way back around, and then we would make a few more minutes of progress. As we began to become too close to sober, we imbibed a bit more. Another 30 minutes or so passed, and we had decimated almost our entire on-hand supply. We also had no clue where we were. As we wandered along the dark, winding roads, we started to get concerned about our phone batteries. His phone was worse off than mine, being near dead already, although mine was hardly doing better. After deciding to keep them in our pockets for the time being, the dark and discomforting silence started to make both of us paranoid. It was, of course, a bit heightened by our habits. We also noticed something else that was upsetting. We had started to go around in circles. As we realized this, I had the first real wave of fear for that night come rushing over me. I could swear that someone was inside one of the mausoleums with their face just barely out of view and moving around in the shadows. Dude, dude, do you see that? On instinct, I grabbed for my inhaler. What? What the hell are you talking about? My friend said. In that, right there. 
I looked toward the window rather than pointing. I swear to Christ, I just saw someone in there. I saw the shadow of a face. My friend brushed me off. You're just freaked out because you smoke too much. It's nothing. Come on, we need to get to the witch, and then we can get the hell out of here. You still want to go see that? Well, yeah. If you don't want to, that's cool, but I'm gonna. I mean, alright, I'm cool with doing that, but I'm just getting a little out of it. About three cigarettes and another hour later, we heard something unnerving. At first, we assumed that it was a bunch of drunk teenagers, based on the volume and range of noises being made. Walking further, we found a sign for construction, and being high, we thought it made perfect sense that a group of construction workers must be around. You know, for some good nighttime, silent construction work. Then the voices began to get a bit too quiet for our comfort. We booked it, barreling in no real direction and somehow ending up at the place. Here it is, my buddy exclaimed. This is it? I looked to a massive circle of tall, dry grass. Is it in the middle of this? No, man, he replied. It's way in the back. Come on, I'll show you. I put another cigarette to my mouth with a slight tremble in my hand and followed him through the pitch black and to a large stone structure in a patch of dirt. It was the family he had mentioned, and it made my stomach turn. The cold, rushing wave of fear came back, but it was too late to change my mind. We walked onto the large stone slab and then around it. As we walked around it, he pulled his phone back out to read the headstones. I was nervous with his light being on at this point, after being near those people that we had seen. After a minute, he turned to me. You want to see the really messed up part? Messed up how? I asked. The forgotten children, their graves are back there down a skinny path. He motioned toward the trees. You down? Well, I said, I've got my smokes. Let's go. We looked at the graves, and my stomach turned, but I was unsure of why. I disliked the idea of dead kids, but my demeanor would never call for me to feel as sick as I did at that moment. Then my friend flipped his phone light back on to read off the names and dates. I started to really become anxious at that point, even voicing it. I scanned the woods, unable to see anything. My friend told me to just calm down, that the people we had seen had probably left by now. Then, we heard a blood-curdling scream coming from the woods. At most, it was fifty feet away. It was an unusual scream, aggressive almost. It didn't sound as if someone were hurt, but more that they were threatening us. I was sure at the time that it was a woman, but the hopeful side of me likes to imagine that we just heard some animal. As we paced back down the path toward the stones at the base, I pulled a few cigarettes from my pocket and began to light them like crazy. This was pushed further by my friend stopping to read more stones as we saw no one following us. Within ten minutes he had had his fill and we continued back into the main area. After even more walking, we passed a group of cars parked in a grass patch. We assumed they must have belonged to the group of people from earlier, but we began to wonder why more than one or two people would be there for so long. Then we got lost for real. Deep in the back of the property, we found the witch's spot, but nothing of interest, so we decided to head back. By now his phone had died, so we used mine to get a map up. We had 30 minutes of walking to get through to get to the car. Halfway back, we started hearing voices again, loud and brash. However, as we got closer, they got less energetic. I peered ahead and froze, grabbing my friend and shushing him. I could see three large shadows right down the path from us. I also forgot my phone screen was on and heard something I'll never forget. Wait, a deep voice murmured. Do y'all see that? See what? A second man joined in. That, right there. The silhouette of his arm pointed directly to us. That light... I slapped my phone screen against my torso, panicking in an attempt to turn it off. Both of us held our breath, staying still as statues while that group kept discussing. Go check it out then, chimed a woman's voice. 
Or are you too scared? Why don't you stay here and check it out while we leave? Oh, screw off, she teased in a way that helped me think they were decent people. We started to shimmy toward the patch of graves to our side, hoping they would forget about us and leave like they had said. But then we saw what kind of people they really were. The first man hushed both of the others and nearly gave me a heart attack. Let's get them. Both men darted toward us, but we were out of sight by then, low to the ground by the hill that we had run across, hiding. We heard them making their way around the area, and we somehow circled behind them, making it out. Then we heard cars starting. For about twenty minutes, these psychos circled through the paths, looking for us, and it cost us another half hour overall. Exhausted, we made our way to the entrance, with an empty cigarette box, an empty bag, and a little bit of paranoia. We got back to his place and spent at least another hour talking about how insane that all of it had been. And then we had a thought. A ridiculous, but unnerving thought. What if we saw nothing at the witch's spot, because she had been in the woods by the family? And then, an even worse thought popped up. What if the scream wasn't aggressive like I thought, and those people had done something to someone right near us? Whatever really happened, I know one thing. I'm never going back there without a full group of friends and fully charged phones. Before the pandemic, I was visiting West Canada, just exploring caves, when I'm pretty deep inside of one, perhaps 70 meters in, I get to this pretty tall section of cavern, and then I hear it, a scuffling noise. I put it off, thinking that it was just some rocks moving. I turn off my headlamp, and then I see them. These two glowing eyes. Glowing yellow eyes. So I turned my lamp on again, and what I saw this time was terrible. There was this grayish thing. It looked humanoid, but its arms and legs were too long and splayed out weirdly. Its claws were long and they looked like they could easily slice through Kevlar. Its teeth were long as well. Its skin was super tight around its ribs and spine. I could see its bones. It screeched a horrible noise. I had to cover my ears. I look back, and it's gone. But I hear this low growl. Well... I felt it more than I heard it. So I start slowly heading back, and it starts moving toward me. So I start running. Pretty close to the exit, I could see the sunset. I felt its breath on me. As soon as I reached the exit, though, it pulled back. Bystanders said they saw it too, that it ran away like lightning. I'm never going to those caves again. For about two years now at my childhood home, there's been something in the woods around it. They've built in the span of two years a house where the woods used to be, but it only seems to have made whatever is there more active. So for backstory, two years ago I was with my dog taking him out to go pee. He was being agitated and skittish, which is very unlike him. He's a chow shepherd mix, and he's as much a protector as any other dog, so his attitude this night in particular had me on edge as well. I went to join him when I heard him growling, so I stepped out to the side of the house, hearing him absolutely lose it. For a bit of setting, there's a fence around the length of our backyard that also goes about halfway up the sides of the house. 
The fence has a gate on either side of the house, and there are trees and overgrowth also on either side of the house. As I step out of the door, I notice something moving in the tree line, so I quickly step back inside. We have a baseball bat for protection, and I went to get that and came back. My dog was still losing it, and was staring at the thing I had seen, and had not moved. He was growling, snarling, and his ears were pinned and his tail was tucked. Something was really, really messing with him. So I go down the side fence, letting the bat clink along the chain link, making sure whoever was there knew that I was armed. I'm five foot four and look really soft or easy to take on, but I can bench 200 pounds and am not afraid. I'm also a bit of an idiot, but I'm not unused to scary things, so I was more annoyed than scared, really. That changed very quickly, though. I stood right behind my dog and looked at this figure, which was still standing dead in place. I considered that there was nothing there, but I wouldn't know until I double-checked. I called out to the figure, telling the person I assumed was there that they needed to get off of private property. They were on my soon-to-be neighbor's land, and I was afraid they had been messing around in the construction process. Honestly, I assumed it was just some teenager. But then I heard an owl coo. And I'll be honest, we don't have many of them here where I live. I sort of feel this cold, damp dread spread across my body, and I hesitate, but I pull my phone out and flash the flashlight. I kind of wish I hadn't. Standing there was a figure, which was ridiculously tall, I'll say eight to ten feet, and thin and wiry. It was in all black, something like a hooded robe. It looked heavy, and it didn't hang naturally. I couldn't tell the physical size of the body of this thing because it was so heavily cloaked, but its face was the thing that really threw me for a loop. It had the face of an owl. I don't know what kind of owl, but the big black eyes, the beak, the round moon face, and it clearly had a pale tan face and the dark brown feathers around the edges of it. It did not blink or move when the light hit it. It continued to just stand there. I could see the rise and fall of its chest. My dog barked for the first time with the light on it, and quickly I turned off the light and moved back inside. I'm a practicing witch, so after that I quickly worked on protections for the house, my dog, and me, and also did a cleansing because I felt almost electrocuted. I've seen it twice since this first time, and my mother has seen it a few times too. She hypothesizes that it's angry about the new construction on the land, and I think it's a warning. I'm going to tell about my experience, but for certain reasons I will not be naming anyone specifically. It was 2014. I was 13 years old at the time and my great-grandmother was in a nursing home as her mental health had started to slip and as my great-aunt and uncle couldn't take care of her anymore. I remember the last time that I had seen her in person. It was a sunny January afternoon and me, my parents, grandparents, and my aunt and uncle had decided to talk outside as opposed to the sad, depressing clinical interior of the nursing home. Despite my great-grandmother having memory issues, she recognized me right away and told me specifically hello. It's March of 2014, and during the night, I'm having memory flashbacks of things that me and my great-grandmother used to do, like stringing long strands of old-fashioned buttons, or the time I had my first ever garden-grown tomato raw, sitting on the porch swing with her while my grandfather worked in the field. I remember waking up that morning and asking, almost demanding my mother to call the nursing home or my great aunt and uncle, and she called them while I took a shower. After I got done, my mother informed me that my grandmother had indeed passed away from old age. I spent the rest of the day walking around our house in an almost trance-like state.
I have not been able to stop thinking about this experience since it happened about ten years ago. I have never felt anything like it. Myself and two friends went for a walk in our local forest. I tend to walk fast, so I had walked on ahead of them. I got to a certain part of the forest and, literally from nowhere, I was struck with the most overwhelming feeling of terror. It was so strong that it literally stopped me mid-stride. I froze and could not move. I was petrified. There was nothing and nobody else around. Then I get what can only be described as a certainty in my head. It couldn't be accurate to call it a voice, rather an overwhelmingly strong sense of knowing that I needed to look to my left. I did so. There was still no one and nothing there, except for a big crack in the side of the rock face that basically made for a small cave. Whatever it was, I knew that it was in that cave, but physically there was nothing to be seen. I am not easily freaked out. I cannot impress on you enough how utterly terrified that I was in that moment. And this was the middle of the afternoon. Had the next part not happened, I could have dismissed this and thought little of it. But it did happen. As I stood there unable to move, one of my friends walks nonchalantly around the corner and immediately, immediately, without me even having a chance to look at her try to move, she stops dead in her tracks and says, Whoa, bad energy off that cave. I try to stumble out some explanation of how I am feeling, but I can't. My brain was literally scrambled by fear. A minute later, our male friend appears. Both of us women start trying to explain to him what was happening, because he felt nothing. He approached the cave to look in, and we two grown-ass women are begging him not to get too close to it. I was actually on the verge of tears. But again, he felt absolutely nothing. He took a long look inside and reckoned that we were both just being a bit hysterical. It was the weirdest, weirdest thing. Whatever was in there was just gone in an instant the second that he appeared. I've always had an uncanny knowing that whatever it was did not intend to harm us. It just wanted us to know that we needed to walk the F away from that area and that it was willing to harm us if it needed to. Oddly, I have such a clear image in my head of the spot where this happened, and I know that forest like the back of my hand. Over the past ten years, I have looked for that cave and that rock face many times. I have never been able to find it again. There's this large section of southwest Austin, Texas that used to be known as the Eanes Marshall Ranch. There's a story to be found about a man who was murdered by bandits, and his body was buried in an unmarked grave on the side of the dirt road after being discovered by the ranch owner. Eventually, the body was found by police over a hundred years later while searching for evidence of deer poaching. Thus, a local ghost story was reinvigorated and spread to a new generation. When I was in high school, my friends and I got it in our heads to go out there and do some ghost hunting before the house was torn down to make way for a church. We took a couple of disposable film cameras, along with a Ouija board, and headed out under the cover of dark. We got there a little after 11 p.m., we hung around for several hours, taking photos of nothing, literally pointing the cameras into the darkness and saying, May I please take your picture? Click. We had a no-smoking rule, and we were not using the flash for the outside shots. We made our way back inside the main house. The smallest member of the group shimmied through an unsecured window in a small side room and opened a door for the rest of us. We took some photos inside with the flash on. My friends spent a good bit of time on the Ouija board. 
I declined to participate in that part and went outside. They came out and claimed to have contacted an entity through the Ouija board. I was like, okay, sure. We left after all the film was spent and we got bored with it. We never did hear the legendary wagon or horses that supposedly come through. Nothing spooky happened at all while we were there. The next day, the cameras were dropped off at Eckerd's to be sent off for development. A few days later, the rolls came back with a lot of black nothing, which was to be expected when taking photos outside at night with no flash. There were a few shots that were taken inside the house while using a flash that had some things that you might call orbs, but those could be explained away as dust or bugs. However, the photo I'm talking about still sends chills down my spine every time I see it. We were very strict about not using the flash outside and not smoking, as I said. We wanted to have our best chance at capturing something like this without having a seed of doubt that it could have been a trick of the light or of the camera. Two of my friends who took part in the Ouija session had several unexplained glass-breaking incidents. They said it happened whenever they were talking about the entity or said its name. They were sitting in the car while parked when the passenger window formed spiderweb cracks like a rock had hit it, but no impact was heard. A few days later, glass cups fell out of their kitchen cabinets, no fronts, just open shelves, when no one was in the kitchen and all the cats were in the living room with them. More than a few of their picture frames had the glass shatter while still hanging on the wall. When they stopped mentioning the entity's name, the activity calmed down and eventually stopped. When I was 17, a senior in high school class of 1997, I stayed with a family in West Ireland as part of my church's program abroad. I lived there for six months. The family's home was a cottage-style home, very old but comfortable and loving. Those were my thoughts, as we pulled up to the front anyway. After I had spent a little time there, I began to feel something heavier. Something silent, yet consuming. At first I kept telling myself, new places, new faces, it's all just new, and that's why you feel this way. Regardless of what I told myself, though, it was impossible to stop the feeling that I had in my gut. The feeling didn't only stay there, either. It grew. I had nightmares nearly every night. Before, I had never so much as remembered my dreams, much less suffered from night terrors. I would wake up with the covers thrown off of my body, off of my bed entirely. Sometimes, I swear, I would wake up just as it was happening, and when I did, there was almost always a cold chill in the air, even in the summer months. There was a boy there, the owner's son, Eric, who I asked whether anyone had ever complained about the draft that would seemingly come from nowhere in that room, the room where I stayed. He told me that there was probably something wrong with the window. He didn't look comfortable talking about it at all. In fact, Eric tried to avoid eye contact and interactions with me in general throughout the duration of my stay. He really wanted to avoid my inquiries. Back to the nightmares. They almost always involved me trying to find the source of this icy cold breeze, with me walking aimlessly around this one room, my room. The chill would almost start to burn my skin. You aren't supposed to be able to feel pain in your dreams, right? Well, I did. So were these actually nightmares or something else? I still don't know. 
Eventually, the nightmares got to the point where I could hardly move inside the dream. I would be bound to my bed, stuck looking around the room. By this time, it wasn't just the nightmares or the blankets that scared me. It was waking up in pain that left me feeling out of control, terrified. I would have visible marks, not scratches, but rather patches of irritated skin. Small rashes that burned. My stomach would ache a horrible pain as though it were eating itself. Again I approached Eric, the son who slept just two rooms down from mine. I asked, or told him rather, there is something seriously wrong with that room. I then showed him my rash and began to explain the nightmares. He was visibly uncomfortable, and then started calling for his mother, Nancy. I liked Nancy. She wasn't as strict as my mother, who was ten years older than Nancy, deeply religious, and highly skeptical about pretty much everything. I respected my mother, don't get me wrong, but I didn't exactly feel like she listened to me when I spoke about many of, well, too much anything, really. And as much as I liked Nancy, I just wasn't sure how she would respond to me asking me about everything. I was quite nervous. Nancy spoke with genuine conviction. She talked as though she had lived a thousand lives, but she also felt incredibly open, if that resonates with anyone. She filled me in on all the local history as we walked through the town and the church. Over the last few months, we spoke of the Great Freeze and the famine that the area had suffered many years ago. She talked about the rebuild. She taught me a lot of things about Irish history and culture, and I found it very interesting that she was a member of their historical society. I had asked Nancy about ghosts before, just general questions, really. Like, had she ever seen one? Would I possibly see one? She laughed, and told me to consider myself lucky if I had seen one on my trip, that she had not seen one in years. I sort of took this to mean my question was silly, that there was no such thing as ghosts in Ireland or something to that effect. Turns out, I was wrong. Eric tells Nancy, Corinne says there's something wrong with her room. She even got proof. He shifts his gaze to me and nods, saying, Show her your arms. My sleeves up, I shift my arms around into Nancy's view. She doesn't look surprised by the markings. I see. She gave a long pause as she examined me before asking, How have you been sleeping? Not great. I've been having nightmares for months, but now it's like I can't move. That's what I was just telling Eric. The two of them look at each other. For some reason, this spirit likes to communicate with the girls. I suppose it was because she was a young girl herself. We believe that her name is Emma. Nancy explains that the house has been in her family since the early 1900s, but prior to that, it was owned by the same family for many decades, and one other just before that. The house had survived the famine. The family didn't. It was typical for families to huddle in the highest room of the house, or for the last surviving members to stay in that type of room, typically children. They didn't always survive. There were several deaths during that time. I was convinced that the area itself was inherently haunted by that point. Why do you think her name is Emma? Have you spoken with her? I asked Nancy. My sister did, Eric piped up. That was her old room. Nancy cut in. Yes, she used a Ouija board, which she didn't have permission to do, by the way. And she says the girl's name is Emma. She died here, in this house, in that room. She died hungry and freezing. Your rashes are probably the early stages of frostbite, Eric said, adding more eeriness to the vibe. There was a bit of silence after his statement. 
I was feeling better, actually. Not about what he said. Just in knowing that I had experienced something that someone else had as well. Did your daughter get these rashes? They both confirmed that yes, she did. Well, how did she get it to stop? She moved out, they said in unison. Attempting to break the slight tension that had begun to build, Nancy tells me, You're welcome to sleep on the sofa. Might not be very comfortable given the state of your arms, but it might suit you better. At that point, I had just one month left out of my six-month stint. I opted to sleep on the couch, but left my things in the room. Every time I entered the room, I would say hello and goodbye to Emma. Once I started sleeping on the couch, my dreams returned to normal. I actually mentioned to them that they should offer the couch first to any future guests, as the improvement was so drastic. They explained to me that they didn't get many guests anymore. Apparently, word had gotten around that their guest room was occupied, if you will. My mom must have missed that memo. They weren't even willing to entertain that what I had experienced was real. Not that I was expecting much. They were by no means an open-minded pair. I ended by saying that when I left for good, I tried to give a pep talk of sorts to Emma. I think she was struggling either to move on, be heard, maybe both. The next time I paid them a visit was on the 10-year anniversary of when I had been living there, 2017. On that visit, I got to meet the sister. She, Eric, and I walked through the old guest room, which had been converted into a sort of sewing room. The sister looked at me and asked if I could feel a difference. I stood there a minute, and closing my eyes, allowing myself to relax, I didn't feel anything except for sunshine coming through the window and tickling my face. I looked over at her and said, It's lighter. And that made both of us smile. This happened in October of 2019. So it was a weekend, and I figured it would be a good idea to get out of town for the day and introduce my girlfriend to my mom for the first time. She lives out on the plains on 40 acres. The house and land are a fourth of a mile off the road into the field, with our long driveway dividing the land of two neighbors. We arrived around noon, and my brother and his wife also happened to be out there visiting that day, so I introduced the girlfriend to everyone and the dogs. I noticed that the loudest and most obnoxious dog, the Beagle, didn't come to greet us, and my mom explained that the previous night she went to grab something from the truck, and on her way in the dog had darted out the door and ran off into the field, and still hadn't come back. This isn't all that uncommon for a dog to run off in the night and come back a couple of days later. Later that day, my mom recalls that her and my nieces were woken up around 1 a.m. to all the dogs howling and barking non-stop, just going nuts. Eventually, they stop and everyone gets to go back to sleep. We continue to have a nice, quiet day out in the middle of nowhere for a few more hours when we noticed that this hawk has been flying around the same spot all day in the field. So my brother and his wife go to check it out, while I mess around doing something else. A few minutes later, my brother comes back and tells me he found the missing beagle, but something is wrong. I should go check it out before telling my mom. I follow my brother out into the field, expecting to find a dead dog. As we were walking, I see a spot of blood and think it was probably coyotes. He shows me a trail of blood that leads to a larger puddle and another trail. The dog seems to have been drug around some. The trail led to an area in the field where the dog lay. As soon as I saw the dog, something looked wrong about the scene. 
All the plants around him were trampled, and something looked different about him. I took a few more steps, and I realized that he was missing skin. This wasn't just a few bits missing from a fight or birds picking at him. The only fur or skin left on him was his head, tail, and paws, with very distinguished straight lines where he had been skinned. Some sick fuck had killed, skinned, and taken the pelt of our dog in the middle of the night, only a couple of hundred feet from the front door. Of course we called the cops. They took two hours to arrive. They took pictures. We looked around the area and noticed tire tracks, but we couldn't tell how old they were. We also found a pile of horse shit that looked pretty fresh close by. Did whoever did this ride a horse out there? To this day, the cops have never followed up with anything, and nothing else has happened. Nature cams were installed, and fences have been mended so dogs can't get out. But we still have no idea who did it. I came across the pictures on my phone today, and can't seem to bring myself to delete them. This happened a couple years ago when I was working at my childhood summer camp. I've certainly gotten strange feelings around the area before, but nothing especially malevolent or frightening. My coworker and I were taking our group for a sleep out, up in some shelters about half a mile into the woods and away from the rest of the camp. I'm used to being in the woods, and I generally don't scare easily, even at night. So when I woke up in the wee hours of the morning, I set out for the latrines without a second thought. I figured it was around 4 or 5 a.m. based on a red glow on the horizon. The light fell softly through the trees, illuminating the path and the color sides of the shelters. The walk was only a few hundred yards, but felt longer with only my flashlight. I was about halfway there before I heard something behind me. Again, I know those woods. I know what most of the animals in the area sound like, from the camp's horses to the local family of black bears. Whatever this was, it was huge. Its presence seemed to close in on me from all around, and I could hear twigs snapping, vines tearing, mud squelching underfoot. I am not fast, and I knew that running on the uneven path in the dark wouldn't get me very far. So, I walked. I walked like I owned those woods, slowly and deliberately until I reached the light on the side of the latrine. The presence had faded. I was even starting to feel good, confident, like I could keep going, keep walking through the dark woods until I reached the sunrise. I had to tell myself to stop, to turn where I meant to turn. I eventually returned to my shelter and fell asleep. Maybe I would have forgotten about it all if not for that sunrise. I've watched so many sunrises over the lake that I should have known better. That red light in the woods wasn't in the east, where it should have been. It was out by the western side of the pasture, blood red and a little too bright for what it was pretending to be. The more I think about it, the more it felt like I was being herded somewhere. I haven't met anyone with a similar experience, but my friends have theories from fairies to alien abduction. I'm not sure I believe that, but I'll never go to that part of the woods alone again. This incident happened to me when I was 14, and I've told the story and gone over it in my mind so many times exactly as it happened that it feels as if it were just yesterday. My uncle, two younger cousins, aunt and I had gone up to the Rocky Mountains to have some fresh air and watch the stars. 
We went up a lot back then, when you were still allowed to at night. Now that park closes at 10, sadly, and our adventures such as this one ended about three months after this incident. Those two things are somehow inextricably linked in my mind. I can't help but wonder. We all five piled out of my uncle's AMC hatchback, a tight fit, and stood around the car on the side of the dark road talking about life and joking about Mothman. Betty, my aunt, was the first to hear a noise in the woods across the road to our left, but we dismissed it as an animal and the adults and I, being older and in on the joke, tried to scare the kids. But a loud crash came from the woods, when no one had thrown anything, nobody had gone over there, and I'd had my eyes on the whole group the entire time, which meant that none of us were laughing now. Uh, <laughs> my uncle chuckled nervously, let's get in the car. We got in silently. Something had changed. The wood was quiet except for the sound of the car itself toiling down the mountain as something followed our car, moving the trees about ten yards behind us on the driver's side where the mountain slanted down. Nothing but trees over here, I thought. What the hell could that thing be? Feeling the tension in the car, I took matters into my own hands and leaned out the back driver's side window intrepidly. It was still behind us, crashing through the trees and moving through the treetops, right after our car. My mind grew curious. Go faster, I urged my cousin Brian. He sped down the winding road, but the thing in the forest followed. I looked at the speedometer. Thirty-five. We could do this. Go faster, I said. It was keeping pace, but always just behind the car. I was livid that I could not catch a glimpse of whatever was big enough to make such a racket and bend the trees to its whim. I finally yelled at him to go faster, but again the thing kept up. Our tiny car was racing down the winding mountain road, sheer rock on one side of us, certain death on the other, our headlights the only things lighting the way down as we sped out the gate of the park, turned, and peeled down the paved road toward town. The kids were in tears. Brian nearly was, too. Betty was silent. Something which, if you knew her, you'd know the gravity of the situation when she actually chooses to shut up. Brian was yelling back at me and asking me what that thing was as I crawled back into my seat and buckled up. No, I said dejectedly. I couldn't see a thing. Months later, I tried to talk to my family about the occurrence, and found that none of them even remembered it except Betty. They had blocked it out of their memories, I guess from sheer shock, the poor souls. Even to this day, my uncle and younger cousins don't even want to talk about it. Looking back now and having watched a lot of Bigfoot investigations since, it's a likely possibility that what I didn't see was a Sasquatch. However, there were things even weirder than that in this local area. I want to begin my story by telling you first and foremost, I do not believe in the supernatural. I have never witnessed a ghost, spirit, entity, or malvoyant force of nature. I have never encountered a poltergeist, demon, or an angel. I am not here to state the validity of anyone else's experiences, only my own. I do, however, believe in things that are good and things that are evil. Is it supernatural? I'm not here to prove that one way or the other. My story begins when I was 20 years old. I was in college, and like most college students, I was rebellious, wild, and carefree. I was eager to obtain a part-time job, I wanted my own spending money, and coming from a very small community with very little businesses, I was pretty much out of luck. My sister, who is seven years older than me, was newly married with a baby, my nephew, and she worked at our hospital, the only hospital in our hometown. She was an RN, and trying to establish a good foundation of employment, so she had to take swing shifts before she could set her own hours. Her husband was working the night shift, so they needed someone to care for my nephew on the weekends. I jumped at the opportunity because I loved my nephew and I was good with him. He knew me and was a joy as a baby. 
I wasn't very popular in college and had very few friends, so having something to do on the weekends brightened my mood somewhat. I started keeping my nephew on the following weekend. It was Friday, February 2nd, 1990. I had just put my nephew to bed and had myself a beer and a cigarette out on the back porch of my sister's home. Yes, I was smoking and had one beer. Get over it. It was the 90s for pity's sake. There were no cell phones, computer with internet games, or chatting, so when I say it was quiet, it was very quiet. They lived on Highway 322 outside of Clarksdale, Mississippi, and there were not many homes on this road at the time, and also very little traffic. I was reading a book, but halfway through the chapter I was reading, you could have heard a pin drop. The crickets stopped chirping, the wind literally stopped blowing, the mockingbird that I heard calling was silent, and the air suddenly felt so heavy that it became very difficult to breathe. I got up, opened the door to step outside, down the steps, and as I'm frantically looking around trying to figure out what the heck is happening, the transformer next to the house explodes. Both streetlights go out, and I can smell burning rubber and plastic. I jumped so badly that I felt my heart catch in my throat, and the sound was deafening with sparks flying everywhere, looking almost like fireworks on the 4th of July. I couldn't hear the monitor to my nephew's room anymore. I realized the power had gone out in the house. That's when I rushed in to make sure he was still sleeping and not freaking out in the pitch black of night. He was perfectly safe, still sleeping peacefully and totally unaware of my miniature meltdown. Just as I was leaving his bedroom, I heard a noise that I still have no explanation for. The sound was a close relation to that of a child crying or a woman screaming. Now believe me when I tell you, I am a country girl, lived in the country most of my life, and I know what a panther sounds like. I've heard it many times. But this was nothing like that. It even resembled the sound of a dying cat or any animal that may be close to death. Incoherent whimpering, a slight cackle here and there, and then silence. The sound sent a chill right up my spine, making me feel lightheaded and weak. I do not scare easily. I consider myself brave and rational, but all of that departed, leaving me feeling dizzy and nauseous. The sound was not coming from inside the house, but outside, close to the porch, right where I had been sitting. I knew this because I left the screen door open, and standing there motionless looking out the door, I knew it was out there somewhere. I waited a few moments, then I reached for my sister's baseball bat that she kept next to the door. She wasn't a fan of guns or knives, and neither was I, but that bat brought no comfort knowing I would have to get as close as possible to this thing in order to hit it with any amount of force. Trying to find the courage to walk out that door, believing it was only an animal brought no solace to me. But I'm tough, and I would do whatever it took to protect my nephew and myself. I stepped out onto the porch and heard nothing. I grabbed the flashlight hanging next to the porch door, clicked it on, and proceeded to look around. I slowly advanced toward the outside of the door, opened it, and walked slowly, very cautiously, down the steps. My heart is pounding, and the only sound I hear is the air leaving and entering my lungs. I feel dizzy and start sweating from fear and adrenaline pumping through me like wildfire. Behind my sister's house, there's nothing but wooded forest and empty fields. Being February, there isn't much going on in the farming community. I make my way to the edge of the field, and I hear it again. That dying animal sound a screech, and then what I can only describe as tearing flesh, or perhaps paper. I have no idea at this point what I'm hearing. I shine the flashlight towards the noise, and what I saw still haunts me to this day. There were glowing red eyes staring right back at me, and in that instant I knew that it wasn't any kind of animal that I had ever heard, seen, or known about. Animal eyes do not glow red when you point a light at them. They're either orange or bright yellow, almost white. Just as I'm about to take a step back, a rush of wind blows past me and I see wings. 
Yes, wings. These wings are at least 50 to 60 feet in width. Far too big for an owl, buzzard, or any other type of bird in that area. When it opened up its wings, the rush of wind almost knocked me off my feet. It had the body of a man and the eyes of a demon, and was enveloped in jet black. I stood there shaking, trying to rationalize what I was looking at, and not believing one minute of it. My hands began to tremble and I felt as though I was about to faint. It stood up and with one quick whoosh, it shot up in the air and then out of sight. My mind raced. What did I just see? What just happened? What was that thing? The moon was out that night, so I saw it shoot straight up and disappear quick and almost with no sound at all. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the area in which I live. But on that very night, the Parker family was brutally murdered. Not an hour after I had seen whatever it was that I witnessed. A family of four had come home, walked in on four burglars, and were tied up, raped, sodomized, and burned alive. Their house was burned to the ground. And the four men who committed this heinous act are still thriving. The justice system in this area rarely sees true justice. After that night, I started researching possibilities on what I had seen, and each time my research led me back to none other than the Mothman. The folklore that surrounds this creature is a sign, an omen of things to come, a tragedy, something so evil you cannot even imagine what it could be. This is the first time I have ever shared this, typed it out trying to remember the little details, and I'm still convinced that what I saw that night was the Angel of Death, Mothman, Lucifer himself, who knows. But I do know what I saw, and I believe with my whole heart that that entity was a prelude to the unimaginable crime being committed that night. I do not believe it appeared to warn me in particular, but ever since I saw it that night, my research has revealed that far more people than me have seen this creature. An entire town, villages, people who have seen this creature right before an accident or traumatic event. Again, I do not believe in the supernatural, but I do believe in evil, and what I saw that night was the epitome of pure evil. I could feel it, smell it, and almost taste it. It exuded evil to the extent that I was almost taken over by it, making me feel so physically ill that I could not shake it off. The next morning when I learned of the murders, which incidentally were only about half a mile from my sister's house, I had that same feeling. Dread, nausea, and a burning in my stomach. I had to run to the bathroom to throw up. It made me so violently ill. I'm sure many will tell me that what I saw was nothing more than some rare bird or something that can be logically explained, but I know in my gut, my heart, and my soul what I saw. It was not of this world, and quite frankly, I never want to see it again. This is my story from about four years ago. I was on a camping trip with some friends when we decided to go a little bit further into the forest to get the best location at the river. We had some beers and went swimming. When it started to get dark, almost all of my friends wanted to go home. Only my buddies Flo and Laura stayed with me. We lit a fire and continued to drink beer. After some hours, I felt like I had to go to the toilet. No problem, even had toilet paper in my backpack. Our camp was located right at the river and a big field of high grass separated us from the forest. I decided to go to the high grass right in front of the trees. So I grabbed my phone as a flashlight and grabbed the toilet paper and went in the direction of the forest. It was pitch black and because of the branches of the trees, I couldn't even see into the forest with my flashlight. So I sat down with my back to the forest and started doing my business. I was about 160 feet away from my friends now and couldn't even hear them talking anymore. 
When I was almost finished, I heard a sound coming from behind me. It was like the rustle of dry leaves or the crackle of branches. I know, it's the kind of horror movie stereotype. I stumbled and said, Hello? Who's there? Two or three times. But no one answered. I thought it might be some kind of animal, so I screamed as loud as I could. But to my horror, this thing got even closer. I finished as fast as I could, which still felt like an hour to me, while the sound came closer and closer with each passing second. When I stood up and started running, the thing was so close that I expected it to grab me from behind as I tried to escape. So I ran as fast as I could, screaming and crying. When I arrived at our camp, I told my friends everything. They didn't really believe me, but they were pretty scared themselves. I was 17 at the time, big and muscular, and normally not the type of guy to cry. But this thing made me cry, and it would make me again. I could not sleep at all that night. I sat in my sleeping bag, the river to my back, while staring into the direction of the forest. There were no sounds or anything, just the sound of the wind and darkness. In the morning, we packed our stuff and made our way home. I won't go anywhere near that forest anymore. Jokes were often made about me, but I know what I heard, and I get the shivers right now just while writing this. In Germany, we have no dangerous animals living in the forests, but every animal in our forest would avoid contact with humans, especially when you shout at them. Two years ago, I was hanging around with a group of mates in a small forest. Now, we've done this before more than once, and never really had anything weird happen except on two separate occasions. The first encounter that we had was a weird formation of stars slowly moving around in the sky in a triangle and within a span of two seconds going incredibly fast and moving out of our view. All seven of us saw this, so I know that it wasn't just my imagination. Now, the second encounter freaked us out the most. This happened at exactly the same location as where we saw the star formation. We were just casually hanging around in the midsummer when around 2.30, out of the blue, I saw someone standing near us. I should point out that he was standing behind one of my friends, who I had just talked to about three seconds before. Everything about this guy struck me as off-putting. I should also point out that it was about 30 degrees Celsius at this time, but this guy was wearing clothes that you would wear in Siberia during the winter. He also wore sunglasses, despite it being nighttime. The moment that I saw him, I instantly felt an intense sensation of dread. The others felt this as well. I asked him what he was doing here, and he just said, listening. After he said that, he moved a couple meters, but there was something really wrong with the way that he moved, as it looked like this guy glided over the ground. Because he got closer, I told him to stay back, and he just looked at me. In that moment, my fight or flight was kicking in hard, and I got the feeling that this guy was a genuine threat, so I got ready to defend myself if he attacked us. But just a second or two after, he looked at me again and just vanished. Like we were all looking at him and one moment he was there and the other, he was just gone. After our initial confusion, we decided that we should book it out of there and we just ran as fast as possible out of the forest. Just a few notes. We didn't use any substances that could have influenced what we experienced. We didn't consume any drugs, alcohol, or anything else. We also remember quite well what happened that day. We're also well known in that forest, and because it's quite small, we have been everywhere in there, and never have we found any signs of homeless people, or anything like that.
25 years ago, I moved in with my cousin along with her roommate and co-worker, Jose. The house was an old cement block, three bedroom, one bath. It had a large fenced-in yard where he kept his two very large German shepherds. The house was in Claremel, Florida, in a crappy, packed, suburban neighborhood. Nothing special. Rent was cheap. The house was clean. Everyone worked. We pretty much kept to ourselves. We might see each other for a few minutes here and there, but that was about it. I lived there for around six months. This is the story of what caused me to move out. One random night on a weekend, we all happened to be off work at the same time. We decided to invite some friends over from the pool hall that we all frequented. Jose also invited over some people who they worked with at the pharmaceutical lab. In total, there were probably 20 people at the house. We played music and did what young people do. After it had gotten late, we found ourselves discussing the subject of the paranormal. We all shared ghost stories. My cousin and I come from a pretty spooky family, so we had some good ones. Everyone was really into the topic. Jose, however, was quiet throughout most of the conversation. He waited until it died down, and then he said, This house is haunted. My cousin and I shot each other a look, before proceeding to laugh because, yeah, sometimes Jose's 20-pound house cat would meow at the empty hallway, but other than that, there was nothing. He then told us that there was a presence, but that it mostly stayed in the shed in the backyard. He was referring to a tiny pink wooden shed that I had never even looked inside. He told us that he always kept the curtains closed in his bedrooms because his window faces the shed, and the door to the shed would not stay closed. He had jammed it shut a million times, but it would always pop right back open, and that creeped him out. He said he could tell when it was in the house because he would always wake up feeling depressed. Once he finished the story, he wasn't the only one who was creeped out. I didn't want to think that I lived with a presence, and I didn't like the idea that it was hurting my roommate. I was a tough chick in my own personal opinion and was like, screw that ghost, I'll shut that door, and you won't have to keep your curtains closed anymore. I said this all because in my heart, I didn't really believe that anything was in the shed or the house. I believed that we were just messing around. So I told them all that I was going outside to inspect the shed and deal with the door. Everyone followed me and while we were walking around to the outside of the house, Jose tried to discourage me by saying that it was a bad idea that whatever was in there wanted that door open, and that I should just leave it alone. When we got outside, it was exactly what I had expected it to be. I looked inside and there was a busted lawnmower, some old paint buckets, rusty screens, and darkness. I looked around outside and found some rusty old shovels in a corner of the garage area. I took one of them over to the shed and kicked the back door into its frame. Next, I took the handle of the shovel and put it under the handle of the shed door. I shoved that into the ground. It was without a doubt secure. We all went back inside and talked some more. It was late, I want to say 1 a.m. by the time that everyone said their goodbyes. We let the dogs into the yard and locked the gate. We made sure that the front gate was secured so that they wouldn't get out. Then we straightened up the house. Eventually, we all made it to bed. Sometime around six in the morning, I woke up needing to pee. I opened my bedroom door. I was very sleepy. There was a weird sound as I opened the door that startled me. It was like fingernails scraping on something coarse. I opened the door all the way, and the shovel fell through the doorway and hit me. I can't even put into words how I felt in that moment. A small piece of dirt stayed behind on the floor. The shovel had been left there, placed, standing against my bedroom door. 
I rushed through the house to the side door, which was locked, by the way, and then out into the backyard. The shed door was wide open. Suddenly I felt as though I couldn't breathe. I ran back into the house. Immediately I pounded on both Jose and my cousin's doors until they both woke up and emerged. I knew, absolutely knew, that none of them had been responsible for this. And based on their reactions when I told them what had happened, that suspicion was doubly confirmed. Jose literally began to weep. He begged me to tell him that I was lying, that I was just playing around for a laugh. He then begged my cousin to admit that she had done it. When neither of us would take responsibility, he went to the store and bought a bunch of religious candles, produced a rosary, and started trying to pray whatever it was away. Or pray for me for being so stupid. My Spanish wasn't even close enough to fluent to keep up with everything he was saying. My cousin, quite the opposite of Jose, was absolutely peeved. She really was ready to fight me. She was adamant that I was screwing around, pulling some kind of a prank. She called me a liar, as well as a child. And that most of all, she didn't appreciate being woken up at the crack of dawn after a night of partying, only to be made a pawn in my little scheme. On my end, though, when I knew that neither of them had put the shovel against the door or reopened it, I was filled with pure terror. There was no way that someone else had gotten into that yard. They would have had to get past the dogs just to get to the shed, and then they would have had to get inside the locked house to put that shovel against my door. I didn't sleep there again without someone in the room with me. Every moment spent there after that night was beyond tense. We all just kind of stopped talking to each other. Jose and my cousin ended up in an awful argument, and she moved out within a week. It took me another two weeks to find a place to live. Whenever I did, I never went back. I'm posting for my fiancé, who experienced this a few years before we met. He was out at night walking our dog, his at the time, in his parents' neighborhood in southeast Louisiana where we're from. It was dark, and on his parents' street there's only two street lamps at an intersection about half a block down from their house, and another at the end of the street a few blocks from them. He got as far as the first lamp when he saw someone, or something, down the street, hunched over, digging in the neighbor's garbage cans under the next light. He thinks it may have been furry, but he said the color was dark, like black, gray, or maybe brown. He stopped with the dog, and this thing notices them under the streetlight and straightens up. He said suddenly it was between seven and eight feet tall, and its legs were bending in the opposite direction that human legs could bend at the knee. It started coming towards him and the dog at a slow pace, so my fiancé noped and turned around to go back to the house. He looked behind him, and it had sped up, so he sped up. And finally, it was full-on running at a lean, and so he took off running back at the house, basically dragging the poor dog behind him, and he could hear whatever it was pounding the pavement. He jumped the ditch, ran through the yard, and into the house. He said sometime after that, he noticed very large, very inhuman footprints in the yard, literally right off the concrete path that leads up to their front door. A few nights later, he went out to smoke around 3 or 4 in the morning, and there were more footprints on the concrete directly outside the door. As if this thing was just standing there, looking in the giant window that was in the front door. Also, this was around the same time that summer when a lot of pets were going missing in the area. As in, you couldn't go a block without seeing missing posters plastered everywhere. We have no idea what this thing was, and he never saw it again after that, and animals stopped going missing shortly after. We've talked about it a bunch of times, and have been trying to figure it out for years.
We used to have a chair sitting in my parents' closet. It was one of those old straw ones that felt like it was going to fall apart every time you sat on it. My sister was born first, and almost every night she would stand in her crib pointing at the wall. At first, my parents had no idea what was going on, until they found out the direction she was pointing was where my parents' closet was with the chair. The same thing happened over and over until I was born four years later. I got the room that my sister had been in. I was one, and when my parents saw me one night, I was doing the exact same thing, pointing at the same spot that my sister had. Time went on and nothing happened concerning the chair. One day my parents went into their closet and found written in crayon the name Sue. My parents have never seen this before. After that, nothing else happened. The chair started to take up space, so my mom decided to take it to the place where she used to work. Our good friend had that class now, and it was all hers. It was a fifth grade science class. After about a month, my mom got a text that Sue was doing things. She said that Sue was dumping stuff off of shelves and throwing things. She said that Sue took a liking to one of her kids and messed with his hair and threw stuff directly at him. That was the last time we ever heard anything about Sue. I would definitely like to go back to see if she's still there. In high school, my friends and I knew a guy named Jean. For whatever reason, Jean had a habit of telling extremely tall tales centered on himself, as if he were trying to make himself look cooler. The most repeated one was his claim that in a nearby ravine, a coven of druids practiced and were schooling him in ancient magic. He always played them straight, as if they were unquestionably true. He never had any evidence. While taking a walk one night, I happened upon a construction site. Being heavily into urban exploration, I explored the heck out of that site and, upon leaving, tipped over their porta potty. I was still a bit immature, and I thought it was funny. After that, whenever I found one, over it went. One day I told some friends about it, and Jean, ever the showman, chimed in with, Oh, that's nothing. I like to burn them down. Arson was most assuredly not our thing, and we knew that Jean was full of it, so we were just surprised when, calling his bluff, he offered to prove it by showing us the fruits of his labors. Five of us piled into the car, only one of us had a car, and followed Jean's instructions. The site was in a rural area with lots of big hills and dense forest, common in the Pacific Northwest. At a sharp elbow on a two-lane road was a gravel turnoff, leading maybe a hundred feet into the woods to a gravel parking lot. This was the starting point for a number of hiking trails. There were no lights there, and the street light out on the road didn't show very much through the trees. Also, there were no other cars. One of the trails began past a gate that was designed to keep off-roaders from the trails, and it took a sharp left turn from the back of the parking lot. The porta potty had been about 30 feet or so up the trail, and on a later visit by day, we found out that Jean really did burn it into a puddle of blue goo. That night, we didn't make it there. We had a couple of flashlights, and we all started up the trail as a group. As far as I can recall, we never heard any noises, animal or human. We got about halfway to the spot, then all of us stopped walking. Someone whispered, Do you feel? and we all bolted down the trail, piled back into the car, and got the hell out of there. Once on the road, we compared thoughts. I felt what everyone else did. The deepest, most intense, raw fear that I have ever endured. It was like we suddenly faced impending death. It clearly indicated, I need to leave right this instant. I can only guess that there might have been a cougar or something, as they've been known to attack hikers, but we saw and heard absolutely nothing. I've read that if a little voice in your head tells you to do something, it's a good idea to listen. Part of me wonders if Jean's porta potty fire pissed off some forest spirit or something. I've been back to that trailhead a few times during the day to show friends where this happened. 
I've also brought a friend who's quote-unquote sensitive, as they say, and they didn't pick up anything. I've had a few odd experiences, including seeing a couple of ghosts, some strange lights in the sky several times, and some other stuff. This is the only unexplainable experience that I've had which was deeply scary. Me and my friends went into the forest that's in my backyard. We went at least five minutes deep into the woods, down to a stream. We looked across the stream and saw a log, or at least what we thought was a log. It might have been, but one of us pointed out that it seemed to have turned its head. We ran as fast as we could back out of there. This was during a sleepover. We went to sleep around 3, but I ended up waking up around 4 after hearing a noise. I saw a shadowy figure that immediately disappeared once I laid eyes on it. I haven't seen anything else since. It could have just been my imagination, but I could have sworn that I did in fact see it. And it had the same outline as what we saw from a distance earlier that afternoon. My friends and I told me that I was just being paranoid, but I don't think I was. So I checked it out again in the same place, and the log figure was gone. So I still feel as if that thing were not after me, but after one of my friends. Two years later, and still, I haven't heard or seen anything of it. Although every now and then, I do get the feeling that I'm being watched. I've been getting a little less sleep, but I think that might just be the fact that my sleep schedule is trying to adjust, but I still don't know what that thing is and whether or not it was real or if it was just part of my mind playing tricks on me. But again, I don't think that that was it. Remember when I said I hadn't seen anything of it since? Well, I lied. The other day I went back into the forest and there it was, in the same position that me and my friends had seen it in two years ago. I brought them over there and they confirmed that they were seeing the same thing. It did not look over this time, but I've had an uneasy feeling ever since. They started to stop with the feeling one year afterward, but when I saw it a few days ago, the uneasy feeling increased. I don't know what it is or what it wants but I don't like it. It's not anything I've seen in any paranormal YouTube videos or anything else about the paranormal, which leads me back to believing that it wasn't real. But my friends confirmed that it was real, and I'm not questioning what they said. So it was real, and it was scary. I hope the uneasy feeling goes down soon, and if the thing ever comes near my house again, I am going to call the police. Oh, and I forgot to mention that the morning after the sleepover, I saw not footprints, but something else that I can't quite put my finger on. Something that no human foot could ever have made. I have no idea what it was, and don't plan on trying to figure it out. For a little background, my mother has been in a long-term nursing facility since March with some serious but stable health issues. Then there was a virus outbreak in her facility and she was diagnosed with it. I of course worried for her condition as she began to decline rather quickly over the beginning of last week. Last Wednesday, I switched off my light at 10 p.m. like most nights, rolled over, and began to doze off. Typically, when I'm dozing, my mind will follow some random train of thought that will lead me off into snooze land. That night, as I was dozing, I envisioned my mother walking into my late father's arms, being hugged by my older brother who had died nine years ago, and having my grandparents and aunt gather around her while being hugged by my father. Then the phone woke me up at 10.30 p.m., the hospice nurse called to tell me that my mother had passed away at 10.15. I like to think that I was seeing her entry into heaven with my family's love and long-missed affection return to bring her to happiness.
My girlfriend and I had found an old way through a forest that we wanted to explore at night, so we packed our backpacks and walked there at around 1.30 a.m. From the Google Maps point of view, that way should have taken us around 10 minutes. We started walking. It was dark and foggy, nothing creepy so far until we reached a small lake. It wasn't even showing on the map. There was a small lodge next to it and a fence around it. We looked at it for a few minutes and went a little bit closer. As we almost reached the fence, a woman's scream came out of nowhere, and we just grabbed our bags and ran as fast as we could. The way we walked felt like it was all of a sudden never-ending. We ran for almost 15 minutes until we finally reached the road. We did not know what was screaming. We didn't see anything, even with flashlights. We decided to go home and wait a few more hours to go back when the sun came up, but when we went there again, we saw nothing. We went to the fence, and there was no scream. We thought that's maybe what triggered it when you got too close because of whatever was in there, but there was just nothing. Also, the way now felt super short, like it didn't even take us ten minutes to walk to the road. But after the scream, it felt like we were running for at least 15 minutes straight. It may just be nothing, but this was the creepiest experience that I have ever had, and I still think about it today. Also, in the following days and weeks, we checked the news for missing people or anything like that. But again, there was nothing. This happened around 12 years ago when a group of teens and a few adult chaperones went to a youth conference that was being held at the casino in Minneapolis. Being teenage girls, my friend and I met these guys and decided to snag. I'm native, so that's like hooking up. We stayed out past our curfew and walked around the casino with them, venturing to the golf course. If you've ever been here, the course is huge. We walk over a few small hills that blocked the casino light, and it was moonlit so we could still see pretty well. One of the guys stops and says, what's that? So we follow his gaze and see this extremely tall, white, almost glowing figure loping along the next hillside. It looked like the aliens you see on TV, tall and slender, but instead of being green, it was completely white. None of us made a sound as we watched it for a few more seconds, when it turned suddenly and started coming in our direction. We immediately took off running and didn't stop until we were back inside the casino. We all had tears in our eyes, and we didn't talk about it after that. I don't remember even telling our chaperones and friends because we got in so much trouble when our group found us. I definitely believe in each tribe's ghost stories, though I never asked anyone about this particular area. I live on the East Coast, so the cemeteries are ancient, mostly from the 1700s. Me and a group of friends went to a local cemetery and decided to do some light, no equipment, just our phone flashlights, ghost hunting. Nothing too eventful happened for the first half hour as we walked around the soldier memorials. We crossed an old limestone bridge with a little creek underneath. As we started to leave the memorials, I said goodbye and people started to feel dizzy or weak in the knees with pressure in the back of their heads and upper neck. A few even felt really tired afterward. We went on a little further, and a couple of the group members decided to split off, so me and two others were going to the oldest section of the cemetery. A girl kept hearing her name, and kept going ahead of us. After we all regrouped and talked over everything that had happened, the other guy in the group pulled his necklace off to give it to his girlfriend, and found out that it was spinning without his hand or arm moving. I personally held his arm and felt his hand. It was not moving. 
It spun for about a minute, then started making an X shape, and then slowly died out. After that, nothing else happened to me or my group. However, the couple said that they were hearing people calling to them from the woods, into an area without roads or any buildings for miles. Needless to say, they thought that we were playing with them, but we were on opposite sides of the cemetery entirely. Just yesterday, I was talking to a girl from the group, and she said that at home, she heard the same voices, plus screaming and people knocking on her door. Today, I found out that she's in jail. What do I do? Should we go back to the cemetery and apologize? Or should we just forget that it happened? So me and my girlfriend went to Eagle Nest, New Mexico to do some salmon and trout fishing, but by the time we got settled in, it was already too dark. So I had the bright idea to go hiking in the dark, with only flashlights provided by our phones. So I checked Google Maps, and saw they had some trails along a river in the Cimarron State Park. We went along Tolby Trail and went around half a mile up and decided to turn around because we started hearing noises and felt a little uneasy. As we were heading back, my girlfriend stopped and listened and said she swears she heard something. She shined her light toward the forward part of the trail, and I did the same. We both saw some huge, gray figure that was way bigger than a bear, and we just bolted. We ran for about 20 seconds, maybe 30, and looked back, and it was still keeping up with us. It then makes a horrible, deep sound that was about the mixture of a sheep, goat, and ram all at once. We make it back to my truck safely, but then we decide to pull back up to the gate to the trail to see if it was still there. But we see a man on a horse that we didn't notice when we were running back. He never asked us what we were running from or yelling at, and the horse was brown, so it couldn't have been the horse that we thought was the creature. We're both so confused as to what it could have possibly been. We didn't notice any eye reflection when we shined the light towards it, and I swear it made no noise when it was following us. It didn't look like a wendigo or a skinwalker. It was way too large. My parents live on about 30 acres of wooded land in the middle of nowhere. I was in high school at this time and was up late on a weekend. I remember that I had fallen asleep in the recliner in our living room and woke up at around 2 a.m. I sat up and watched TV for about half an hour and then got up to get some water before going to bed. Our kitchen sink looked out over our backyard, and I could see clear to the tree line because of a lamp on a telephone pole that we had installed for security. As I looked out, I saw something dash across the tree line for about 50 feet before going back into the trees. I can still see it in my mind. It was either a white or really pale gray, and looked like a person moving on all fours. There was no visible fur or clothing. I could tell it was large, at least the size of a person, maybe larger. It covered the 50-foot span in between 5 and 10 seconds. I was absolutely frozen in place for a solid minute after this encounter. My parents kept telling me that it was just an albino coyote. I know it wasn't. A few years later, I came across a YouTube video talking about really strange creatures caught on trail cameras. It was one of those low-quality edits that pop up on your recommended videos after a long video binge. Halfway through came an image that made my blood go cold. It was called a rake. This was exactly what I had seen. 
To this day, I will swear by it that I saw this creature, and still refuse to be outside at night at my parents' house. I live in a rural, but not isolated, area in the Midwest. My window is right up against the forest, which is about 50 or 60 feet away from the tree line, about 20 or so feet above ground level. I heard what I am convinced was a low, echoing humming like a song from the woods. I've heard turkey, coyote, fox, deer, squirrel, and so on before, their cries, calls, and barks. This was none of those. As I laid there in bed, as I began to concentrate on the sound, I couldn't shake the mental conclusion of, it's a woman singing. The sound persisted for about 15 to 20 seconds and then stopped, but not suddenly. After a minute or two later, it picked back up again. This continued a few more times before it actually did stop completely. The sound was distant, not quite deep into the woods, but also not at the tree line. There's a small unit of deer that sometimes sleep in a clearing in the woods around that area, but they haven't been there in a few weeks. For some context, I am very much a late-night person. I used to work graveyard shifts due to my ability to stay alert so long into the night. This is how I know what all these common and uncommon woodland creatures sound like. And no, I did not look outside of my window. My process was this. If I can't identify it, don't look for it. I still think I was right to not seek out an immediate answer. Additionally, the song was clear. My dad used to work at a homeless shelter. He usually helped them find jobs and things like that. When I had to go with him, they left me in a room with a bunch of Disney VHS movies with some printout coloring pages and a bunch of colored pencils. So a lot of these people were drug addicts or recovering, that or schizophrenic. I was there because my dad left something there, but I wanted to go to my room which the nice lady called the room. My dad was talking to this woman outside the door, which was closed. Then the door locks. All I could hear was screaming and crying outside. The knob shook, and I walked over to unlock the door, but my gut told me that if I did, it would not be good. So then a guy began to bang on the door, screaming for me and calling me baby girl. I didn't know what to do when I heard a very loud gunshot, followed by my dad screaming for them to stop shooting due to me being behind the door. He stabbed the woman who had used her keys to lock me in that room, and she did not make it. I was okay, but in the end I just remember a very nice cop opening the door and covering my eyes while they took me outside to an ambulance. R.I.P. Miss Rose, and thank you for saving my life. I am eternally grateful. Homeless man, let's not meet again. About a year or two ago, I was in my room sleeping. I was on my side facing the wall with the closet in it. I don't even remember waking up. I was just all of a sudden propped up on one arm, still on my side, staring at the closet. I couldn't move either during this event. So as I was stuck staring at the closet, the closet door began to open, and I heard whispering coming out from within. I couldn't make out whatever was being said, 
but when the door was open almost fully, I saw a light, grayish, off-white humanoid figure standing in the doorway. I still couldn't move, and then just like that, the figure was gone. The closet door shut, and I was wide awake, laying on my side without any memory of lying back down. It's important, I think, to note that I never felt any fear during this event. I didn't have any kind of emotional response at all. I was just watching what was happening. Any explanations for what it could be, paranormal or not, is appreciated. Also, I've never experienced any kind of sleep paralysis before this or after, and this has never happened again. The area where I live is a heavily wooded Indian residential area and we have no neighbors and the closest town is about 15 minutes away. The only animals that come around are coyotes, black bears, sometimes wolves, and since I live in the southern part of Canada there aren't any mountain lions that I've seen anyway. So a few nights ago around 2.50 a.m. I heard my dogs barking like crazy and I got pretty annoyed by this because they never usually do it. It was hard for me to sleep, and I pulled out my phone to check the time, and like I said, it was almost three. Since my bedroom has a window, I opened it to call my dogs back, and they didn't stop barking. I tried a few more times, but then I heard a sort of wailing, crying sound from the woods. I heard foxes can sometimes make screaming sounds, but this didn't sound like a fox's cry. I don't think it could have actually been a woman, considering, like I said, that we don't have neighbors. I tried telling my grandfather, but he doesn't hear it, and when I told my grandmother, she didn't want to talk about it, since she can sometimes be superstitious. My mom and grandma have had similar experiences with premonitions, but I am now 21 and have been having them for the first time in my own life recently. A few weeks ago, I had a very vivid dream about my childhood best friend who I haven't seen or spoken to in years, and I woke up the next day to find out that she had committed suicide. Then this past week, I told my boyfriend that I missed our old co-worker, who we also haven't seen or spoken to in a few years. And come to find out, he suddenly dropped dead about 15 minutes before I had made that comment. Today, I took a nap and had another very vivid dream, very lucid, about my high school boyfriend. And now, I'm a little bit freaked out, and I'll definitely be watching his social media over the coming days hoping that this has just been a weird coincidence. In the home where I lived from ages 8 to 16, I would always hear church bells ringing early in the morning. My sister, who shared a room with me, said that she heard them as well. And this was before I ever mentioned them to her, so I know that it wasn't my imagination playing tricks on me. I never even thought it was weird until I was in my early teens when I realized that we don't live near any churches. Or at least, not any active churches. I was so used to it that I'd never really even taken the time to actually consider it. When I brought it up to my mom, she had no clue what I was talking about. It was the same with my next-door neighbors and other friends from the neighborhood. 